Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros. Who do we got here, Dan? We got uh, Hamidi Jassim, the terrorist whisperer. Yeah, the terrorist He whispers whisperer. to terrorists and tickles them until they go away. <laughs> and, until and, they laugh. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so they, it's called a hearts and minds operation, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it's the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we do. We have the terrorist whisperer in... Yeah. in Studio today in Wilmington, North Carolina. You wrote uh, you wrote a book about your life, about your experiences overseas, and now it has been turned into a movie, which is available on Amazon Prime. Right? Yep. Yeah, you can correct. rent it or buy it. It's out yep. now, and it came out on nine eleven. Right? Yep, that's correct. Anything happened on the day? Totally kidding. <laughs> what if Amazon just picked that for you and they were like, hey, man, that's your release yeah. date? Because that happens. That happens. It, it, it happens sometimes, yes. It, yeah. It, it wasn't meant to be just for that day, but <laughs> it, it was the perfect day to, just to remind Americans, you know, what, what's, what's like to face terrorism in Iraq during that time. So did you get to pick the release date or did they pick it? No, actually, I, I got to pick the release oh, date. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, sometimes it doesn't work like that. And it's yeah. just like, hey, here you are. And I was like, yeah. man, what a wild... Set of circumstances yeah. that was like, what if yeah. you were a teen movie and you're just like, yeah. oh, when's your movie coming out? Nine yeah. Eleven. Oh yeah, nothing but comedy on that day. <laughs> <laughs> nothing but comedy on yeah. that day. Thank you for coming down to Wilmington, North Carolina. My you have pleasure. A fascinating story, which we will get to in a moment. Um, we have some sponsors who pay for for the show to be on the air. Typically, we do this in the middle of the show. I have a feeling, however, that this episode will probably be pretty intense. Uh, so we'll knock that out at the top. That way, I'm not asking you about uh, people who died overseas. And then all of a sudden, it's like, nope, but we got this other thing that'll keep you alive. And I'm talking about <laughs> KillCliffCBD.com. So no, we're not going to do that. So we'll do the, the sponsors uh, right now. Uh, D'Anthony, as always, we have GhostBed.com forward slash Drinking Bros up first. Halloween season. Halloween. Uh, their deals are incredible, by the way. So if you go there right now to uh, ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros, you'll see a wheel yeah. um, that you can spin $9.99 off a bundle package if you get that right now. Nobody's doing that best in the biz. Wow. They have ghost beds over in Iraq? What's that? They have ghost beds over in Iraq, the mattresses? Um, They don't. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, unfortunately. <laughs> they should. They should have That's why everywhere. most Iraqis have back problems. Over yeah, there. yeah, it I'm is. Sure. They it's sleep the in the ground. Lack of ghost bed. Yeah, lack of ghost yep. bed, sleep on the ground. Yep. That's yeah. right. Yeah, go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today. If you were military or a first responder, you get 15% off everything in the store. They get pillows, sheets, mattresses, their pay as you go program, 36 months off interest, for, uh, 36 month, no interest. There it is. Right. Uh, 38 bucks a month is always up and running over there. And uh, Killcliff, CBD.com. We were joking about them at the top, but that, that is the best in the biz. It is. Everybody's buying this shit. I don't know if you're a CBD guy, but. If you Dude. got back problems, you need to be drinking this shit at night. I can tell Man. you that. Man, uh, 25 best. milligrams in a can, that is that is the best in the biz. Drinking Bros, promo code, uh, gets you uh, 20% off a case. And uh, and they get free shipping. Yeah. It's only knocks it down like four bucks a can. And there's two new flavors coming out, too. That's it. Um, soon. The that, best soon. in the biz, and it, it sells out super fast. So go and get this. Everybody's buying like this by the cases, including myself. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, we're talking about... Uh, Buyraycon.com forward slash drinking bros earphones best in the biz wife had them in last night she uh, got the new ones though right she did I was listening to the new Kanye album with them in uh, they're they're bangers dude a hey, pop go to buyraycon.com forward slash drinking bros affordable headphones 15% off knocks it down about 55 bucks and uh, they're the best wireless in the biz put them in a box charge them five hours later you're, I mean, five hours they last, and you're, you're off to the races. Um, good luck beating that in today's market at buyraycon.com forward slash drinking bros. Now we can get into it because, uh, again, I have a feeling this is going to be pretty intense. Um, were you born and raised in Iraq? Yes, I was. Born um, and raised in Baghdad, Iraq. And so <coughs> you mentioned, you know, obviously in the book that, that you grew up under um, uh, Saddam's regime, right? Um, what, what was that like as a child? Um, definitely there was no childhood during Saddam regime. You know, Saddam regime was a, a dictatorship that controlled the Iraqi people. Uh, we pretty much lived like similar to what North Korea is living. Right now, we, we had only t two TV channels that was broadcasting by Saddam Hussein. 
Um, we didn't have any f cell phones or internet or anything. We were just a block from the whole world. So if you grew up there and trying to figure out what was happening outside of the world um, or outside of the box you were living in, it's very hard. So you were being taught every single day the propaganda that Saddam was, you know, showing to the Iraqi people. Um, so it, it was not easy childhood. It was a tough one, uh -huh. and you know, especially when you know your schools were full of Ba'ath Party members, which is Saddam's political party members, and you know, when you talk about political parties, we're not talking about you know Republican or Democrats. We're talking about people who are vicious, who are armed, who have guns. They can, they have authority, um, and that's the life we had. Did you see people getting killed as a child? Oh, absolutely. I mean, in Iraq. It, this was this was one of Saddam's styles is that if you went against Saddam in any way, uh, in any fashion, um, and you get caught doing mm -hmm. that, uh, they'll execute you in public. I mean, Saddam was notorious for promoting his own family members up through the ranks of the military and government. And then when yep. they became too powerful, he would execute them because yep. he didn't want a threat to his regime. His, his regime. His, yeah. yeah, man. So um, it's not like if you're a regular yeah. citizen and you're trying to do something, it's like, nah, fuck you. Yeah, and, he, and he was like, he was a genius when it comes to scaring people. I mean, I think he, he's a master of fair tactics because anytime he caught somebody doing something against him, uh, made sure that he executed him in public, made sure that the family of that person paid for the bullets that were shot into his head. Uh, the guy was... Like a tax. He really? charged them yeah. for the weapons used to kill the family members. To kill members. the family yeah. members, yeah. Absolutely Jesus true. Christ. Did yeah. the family have to watch it too? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes the, what, what they used to do during my time is they would let schools out. They will tell the schools that you don't have classes for the rest of the day, and you would go to the field and watch somebody get executed as a child. So how old were you when you, when you saw your first execution? I, I mean, I, I was probably around, like, 11 years old. Someone got executed in the town, and they, they, they shot him in the head in, in public. And when you grow up into that as a child— yeah. It, it, it's. I think the point of it is to put fear into your hearts, mm -hmm. to to let you know that if you ever come to that position, this will happen to you, and that's why people in Iraq during Saddam was af were afraid to talk about politics in front of their own wives, because people didn't trust each other. In in the house. In the house, they yeah. couldn't they didn't trust each other. They were afraid that their wife, or their 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 brother, or their sister will go write a report to the Ba'ath Party, and you're done, you're, you're finished. No shit. Yep. That's that's how was it is. You, was your parents' relationship like that? I mean, it, uh, they made sure they never spoke politics in front of me because I was a child, and they weren't sure if I would go out and repeat what I have heard. But um, you kind of felt it. You felt the air was not clear. That you know uh, you couldn't express your opinion about any, anything you see. Uh, and I, I got my own taste at age twelve when I went to prison. Um, you know, as a prisoner under that regime. Sorry. 12, 12? Uh, yeah, I was 12 years old. And yeah. for what? So I was walking out of my school, uh -huh. and I had money in my pocket. It was a, a normal uh, actions for bath party members or uh, specifically people who were in the bath party. Uh, they can do whatever the hell they want to. So I had money in my pocket, and it's a normal practice back then if they stop and say, hey, what you got in your pocket? And you just hand it over and walk away. Uh, for me, I was putting money for a shoe. Uh, that I was trying to buy a shoe. I had a shoe for three years. One shoe? Yeah. I mean, it's like I wanted, I wanted to like, uh, I remember like uh, going to school as I had a shoe that was open from the front. And, uh, you know, during Saddam Town, we had sanctions during the 90s on us. So life was really rough. Uh, if, you, if you lost your shoe, you don't have a replacement. So I was putting money together, you know, through the holidays, putting things together. And, uh, and, this, and again, just to clarify, yeah. you're just saving up for one shoe it just you know just saving up to actually to buy a pair of shoes okay you know and and uh you can tell about what a bath party looked like during that time because there was something about them the the tone they used the way they dressed the haircuts um just something yeah. that you can tell from any citizen that this is a person who has an authority this this one doesn't even though there was a three police officers who who approached me but only one of them that gave me that that feeling that this was a Bath Party member from the where he put his pants right to the right side of his hand, the uniform, how clean he looked versus the other people who were following him. Um, and he asked for money and I, I had a talk bag with him and I ended up cursing him and he hit me. Um, and uh, when I cursed him, he grabbed me, threw me in, in, into the, the car. And I, I thought 
which was the normal thing back then that they would beat the hell out of you and throw you out of the car uh -huh. after a couple hours or whatever. So obviously in our culture, this was a big deal if you curse someone and you said, you know, like F, F in your sister or whatever. And he obviously got mad and um, he drove for about 45 minutes. I didn't know where I was going. And, that, and that's what you said, fuck your sister? No, no, it was, it was, it was just outside way before he took me. Sure. It was when I just said, F you, whatever, and he got mad. This was a big deal in our culture. He put me in the car, and he's uh, driving. And I'll never forget the conversation that actually went on between, um, my, b between him and the two other guards who were sitting behind with me. And um, well, there was an older guy who was sitting in the back, and he was like, hey, you know, he's just a child. Uh, why don't you just slap him and let him go home and he said if you keep talking i'm going to throw you what i'm throwing him tonight and everybody just went quiet and at that point i realized that 45 minutes in the car i drove way too far from where i was living mm -hmm. and i had no idea it got dark and i had no idea where i was going at that point and then the car drove into the iraqi ministry of interior which is a prison that was like nobody was aware of um and uh when I when I walked into a prison, it was like uh, nothing like an American prison. You you would see it's more of like an animal cages. That Is this like, like the one of the ones that Uday ran back in the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's inside of the Ministry of Interior. Yeah, yeah. And this is where they took people who had like obviously bigger crimes or have done things against the government. And I, I wasn't you know I wasn't sure. Like I was like I didn't do anything. I just I just cursed the guy. I refused to give him my money because it's my money. Right. And I didn't want to give it to him. And. Uh, at that point in my life, I, I realized that I was not living in a normal place and that they could do whatever. We have a saying in Iraq that said, uh, a, pen, a pen can kill you before a gun does. And what it means is that they can write a false report. If you're a Bath Party member and you write a report about somebody, they don't care if it's false or not. Your word is, is, is the Bible. They'll take it and they will charge you based on what this Bath Party member has, has stated. So I wasn't sure where they were going to say that I did. So I, I walked in, and then <coughs> I walked into a room, and uh, there was guards who carried big, long bats in their hands. Uh, and the place didn't look right. It didn't look like a normal prison. And I what walked if, into What about it wasn't normal? Was there dirt floors? Was uh, there no, no it, it, was, it was like more of a, a concrete prison, and then there had like more of like a fences around it. They looked like an animal cage. Look like a zoo in a way. Gotcha. And um, it's dark. You can't see what's behind. Uh, and then, you know, as a 12-year-old, I, I was terrified. I was shaking. I didn't know what I was doing. And I walked into a table where he was sitting, and he spent about three, four minutes writing in a paper. He filled on a paper. I, I don't know what, it, what, what was said in it. He gave me the pen, and he said, sign. And I, I was scared looking to the left-hand side of that room. In each corner, there was somebody with a long bat. And I took the pen. I, I didn't even look. I just said, where to sign? And it was like, here in the bottom sign. And I signed. Mm -hmm. And in that paper stated that I attacked a police patrol and I was trying to kill a Bath Party member. Holy shit. So I signed it. I didn't know what the hell I signed on. Yeah. So I signed and I was like, what's next? Do I go home? Yeah. And at that point, I was grabbed, walked into inside. And then it's like a dark hallway. And I walked into a, a metal door that was a very small metal door. They open it and... I got kicked as I went in. And when I went in, it was like a, a war house that was full, full of people who were just sitting in concrete floor. It's not like an American prison. You have beds and a couple inmates in a cell. No, it was a bunch of people in one place, and there was like one bathroom to the left, to the right side. And I sat there, and, and it, it, it was a terrifying moment because you sat there, and people were like, who are you with? Uh, who, who did you? Who are you fighting with? Who, what did you do? And I'm like, I, I didn't. I just refused to give my what's equal 500 Iraqi dinars, which is equal like uh, uh, 20 bucks. Uh -huh. And that's what I just refused to give away. And people just kind of want to slap you in the face, like you really refused to give him the money. You should have just gave him the money, and walked away. Right. And uh, I sat there. And uh, how many people would you say were in that room? I would say honestly, it was around like maybe. Three to four hundred people. Holy shit! Yes. Oh yeah, there's a lot of people. Jesus Christ! I mean, if you go into and, a local town like yeah. Jared and I were in the Bader Shab area, right next to Sadr yeah. City, yeah, and just the little, the small yeah. little IP, the Iraqi police stations, 
Yeah. They would have a room about half this size, and there would be 30 or 40 people in there just sitting on concrete yep. floors. Yeah, wow. it's like more like next to each other kind yeah. of thing. And Any I, other kids? Were you the only I, kid? I, I, I was There's there, always kids. I was there with the three others, but what I noticed as I went in is that I never forgot his last name. First, because they had a little patch here. It's like a white plastic patch. And you know the guy that arrested full, you? Yeah, the, the guy who got me there. And I, I, I remember... As he took me, I looked at his whole entire name, and I never forgot his whole entire name. Four names are one next to each other. And as I walked in, like all these guards, he was talking to, and I'm looking to the last name, because we go by tribals in Iraq. Mm, right. And I looked that all the guards in that prison actually had the same last name as him. They're from the same tribe. Wow. So I'm like, I got in, and they like already knew who you are. Uh-huh. Um, there, there was nothing that was gonna help you. So my biggest worry in that time of my life was how do I let my family know that I'm here? Right. There's no fucking one phone call on Iraqi jail. How do I life. like figure this out? Cause I'm sure they're, they're looking right now at this point right. for me. I didn't come home from school Sure. and there was no way for you to know. There's no like a digital system or you can go ask around and you call them. You're gone. What year is you, this? Th- this was back in the nineties. Okay. So I kind of just sat in there and I always, because I knew of this practice, I always kept half of money in my socks. Uh-huh. I had some money in my wallet. I always kept half of it in my socks because it happens all the time. It's like I Mexico had, now. I had that fear. This is the same kind of deal. They, like if you, if you bump into any of those IP guys back in the day, they just jack your shit. Gotcha. Yeah. And roll out. Why, well, dumb question, but why not keep all, all the money in your socks? I mean, it, I if just, you don't have anything on you, if, they'll start looking. If, if it's like, ah, if more gotcha. of they find what's in your pocket, mm, they yeah. think that's all you have. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So they, they don't look anymore. Once sense. they find some money in your wallet, they don't look anymore, and you might lose half of your money versus losing all of it. Mm-hmm. And I spawned a prisoner who was next to me, and I, and I told him, like, I just want to figure out a way. And he said, you know, he said, do you have any money? It's like, I said, I do. I have, I have money in my socks. So he said, you know what? There's a guard here who's corrupted. And during the night, he cleans the, the director of the prison office, and it has a, a landline in it. And he goes, if you have some money to offer him, I can connect with him. And at that point, I'm like, my, my family's probably freaking out. So I, I gave him the money. He talked to him, and he gave him the money. He's like, I just said, I said, look, I need you to tell me who answers the phone as a confirmation um, that, that my family knew, knew what happens to me. At that point, I realized that I wasn't leaving that place. It's, it's crazy you knew to ask that at 12 years old because I don't think that I, you know, because, I would or an American would. Because you're soaked into that life you right. know you're soaked in that culture you're soaked into their tricks you know exactly what they're doing in the, in the daily basis mm. um so it's not you can never compare that to an american child being in a prison and and i at that point i um got the phone you know i got the phone call they, they let my family they gave me the name of my brother who answered uh-huh. and i sat back and uh they 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 have he obviously have made a, a deal where when everybody leaves that's the time where those guards can come take me out of the, the prison and take me to the back, which they have a room that's called the torture room. They call it the disco. Okay. So when they call your name, they, they, they don't call your name. They said your name, first name, and then they saw disco time. And you don't know what that means. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, two of them with the same last name opened the prison door, and they, they called my name, and they said disco time. And I don't know what that meant. I just said, I'm like, does that mean I'm going home? Am I... And, and one of the prisoners just tapped on my shoulder and he said, look, scream as, as much as you can until you bother them by your voice and they let you go. And at that point, I, I, I just didn't know at that point in my life, like, what's going to happen? And when I was taken, it was like a, a butcher store. They take you from your feet, hang you up, uh-huh. and they start kicking you. So when, Kicking you with their feet? No, no, kicking with bats with their feet. Okay. And what they do... They, the, the way they would torture you with, they had hoses, like, you know, the water hoses, uh-huh. and they will stick a stick inside of it. They'll put like a, a, wood, a wooden stick that would fit inside of the hose. So that hose becomes very like, um, it, it becomes like, rigid, yeah. Yeah. like very lethal, yeah. literally. When they hit you with it, you would feel your brain cells breaking inside of your skin when, when they're doing that. And um, I think I passed out about a half an hour. And I was screaming as much, and then I, I was pretty well, much in a different out. world. I found myself back in the prison, and the prisoner said, you know what, they'll come back, they'll do that again. And, and, and how long 
until they did that again. Next day. Holy shit. Because they do it every time that the prison closes and it goes to the nighttime where there's nobody. These guards are like literally doing whatever they wanted to. Out of boredom or yeah. was this a system? No, that, this is if they if if you are someone that they have something personal with, mm-hmm. they did that with you. It's kind of like a reception. But for me is that I'm looking at their last names. I knew these, these are all cousins of his. So my family have immediately taken actions, have paid, uh, met with the director of the prisons. And at that time, my papers were being written and was about to go face a judge which is the Bath Party Supreme Judge back then. And if I go there, there was no way going back. I will actually get charged as an enemy of the state. Okay. It doesn't matter what's written in there. So the, the director of the prison says, you know what, I, I, give me, go give me that much money. I will take the report, I'll smash it, and I'll just throw him out of prison, which I didn't know of all this process. Right. I'm inside being beat the shit out of. And you're 12. And I'm, I'm a kid. Yeah. And at that point, I have lost the part of being a kid. Right. I was a prisoner at that point. And I'm sitting in there, and the food was chickpeas, raw chickpeas in a, in a water. There, there was no, no, there's no food. It's a raw chickpeas and a piece of bread that you can, I can hit you in your head with it, and, <laughs> and you'll, you'll, you'll pass out. With, it, with, with four, three or 400 people yeah. in, a, in a prison, yeah. uh, are other, because look, if, if you're only eating chickpeas, yeah. are other prisoners trying to get those from you? Because I would imagine they it's would a, be hungry a, enough. They actually, they weren't taking it from, they were actually trying to help you acclimate, like more get used to the situation. So I didn't know Those how the hell I was going to eat that chick. And they were like, just put your hand, crush them, let them soak in the water for a longer period. Uh-huh. Crush them with your hands when they soak in the water and then just eat them, put it in your mouth. Holy shit. Yeah. And, uh, and he, you know, I waited, started putting them in the water because at the beginning I couldn't eat them. They were like pretty much, it's like not even half cooked. They literally mm-hmm. just warm the water. Um, and it's intentionally they do that. They could actually cook it, but they do that intentionally. So... I, I started eating, and I, I, I was too afraid to go to the bathroom. And I, I just sat there, and, um, you know, some prisoners were like, you know, get used to it. You don't know where this is going to go. I had no idea my family was, like, in the doing anything or talking or anything. I had no—I was uh, blocked from the whole world Sure. at that point. I had no idea what, what was happening. And at that point, I, I kind of gave up that— uh, it's either I'm going to be here for whatever time or I'm going to die on here. And I'm, I, at that point, I was looking like death would be so much easier than being here for many years. So I, I, four weeks later, the prison door, I, I was asked to be come out. And uh, at that point, I didn't go towards where, they, where the torture room is. So I went to the opposite way. And I never went that opposite way uh, since I entered the prison. So at that point, I was... Like, they're probably going to put a bullet to the back of my head or they're just, I'm, I'm probably going to go to a different level where they give you, like, an orange uniform and kill you. So I was like, that point in my life, I was, I was done. Mm-hmm. At, at that point, I didn't care. They just told me where to go, and I walked. And I came out, and then the the sliding door was in front of me, and, and the sliding door opened. One of the guards just pushed the sliding door, and, and when the sliding door went to the left side, I saw my dad. And at that point, I just... I just like stopped. I didn't move. And um, I had handcuffs that was behind my hands. And <coughs> and the person opened the handcuffs and he's like, go. And I just looked back and I, I waited for another one. And he's, he just said, go. And I walked. And um, I didn't have anything to say to my dad. or uh, I was a quiet. And uh, Were you crying? Was he no, crying? No, not at all. I didn't cry. I just Both of you guys were emotionless? No, not at all. I think my dad was scared. I was scared too. And we, I just looked at my dad, and my dad, I think my dad was was mad that I didn't give the money. Gotcha. Like, why didn't you just give the money and walk away? And um, I walked out, and I went home. And since that moment, my life has, you know, my life changed. Did you guys was, ever have a conversation about it together? Uh, no. We went home. It was very awkward, weird. Um I, I went and I, they, they took me to the doctor to check my skin to make sure I didn't catch up any infections and from the, the ones I have. To, so it, it was a very different moment, but they told me that, like, if you ever, ever had anything happens in your life again, 
you're gonna you're gonna keep this money in your pocket. You're gonna hand it over and walk away because you would never ever be able to have a second chance in your life. You're done. And I went back to school. I was an A student. I became a, a, a an F student. I didn't care about school anymore. I didn't care about like uh, sc- scoring uh, high in chemistry. I didn't I didn't care about anything. I was just showing up to school. I didn't. I didn't hear the, the teachers talking. I didn't care. I was just in a different world. I was failing. I was not doing too well. And my life was really a struggle until 2003 when I opened my front door and there was an American soldier standing there. What was that like? It, it was shocking for me, you know, because people... Like, like, obviously, you guys knew that the Americans were there, right? Uh, you know, for us, it was hard to believe that if they were Americans or not. Right. Because in our brain, we believe that Saddam will be there for 500 years and, and, and he will never go away, that his kids will take over and then we will live in that environment. So we had this experience back in the 90s in the first Gulf War where Americans came in and then they pulled out. Very yeah. briefly. Yeah, it was a quick. Briefly and yeah. quick. And we saw what happened in the South for people who didn't fight the Americans or yeah. helped them out. And the Kurds up north. They buried them alive. Yeah. So people were afraid. Like, what, what do you do? There's an Americans outside. But what if they leave tomorrow and then Saddam is back and he's going to, you know, punish the hell out of you? <coughs> so I opened that door and I had nothing to lose, you know, like in my life at that point. I just looked and I, I asked the soldier who was out in the front and uh, I looked at him and I'm like, you know, I said, you know, my, my family and everybody in the neighborhood was like, you know, what, what if they're not Americans? What if it's tricked by Saddam? And I said, I was like, guys, this is the whitest Iraqi I've ever seen in my life. Like, this dude is white. Um, and I, I came out. I, I, I looked at him and I said, uh, I, I, was like, what? I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Brad. And I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Texas. I said, Brad, are you guys leaving this time? And he looked at me. He's like, what do you mean we're leaving? I said, I, are you guys leaving, like, after this? Or are you guys staying? He's like, no, 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 we're, we're staying. And when he told me that, I opened the rest of the door. And I was like. I was like, and he was like, are you happy? Are you, are you fine with us being here? I'm like, I'm like, you don't have idea, any idea what we've been through. Um, and for us to see you here, all of a sudden you open your eyes that Saddam's gone, the Bath Party members you looked at your whole life are gone, their houses are empty, and you're looking at a white dude in front of your house. Yeah. It's just a shocking moment for mm-hmm. us. So I walked with that soldier, actually. Kept asking him the same question. Are you guys leaving? Are you guys going to stay? How old were you at this point? Um, I was like uh, 17 years old. Okay. And I, I, I was just thinking, like, how has my life just shifted? And now I went from having no future that I could have a future, actually. And um, within, like, days, they let go of the old Iraqi military. And, uh, you know, Paul Pramer at the time, he was the, basically the president of Iraq or mm-hmm. the person that ran Iraq until a new Iraqi government or assigned. So he let go of the old Iraqi military. And they were doing commercials on the radio, like, do you want to join the Iraqi military? And during Saddam, the military was mandatory. So no one Iraqi <laughs> wanted to be in the military anymore. No one Iraqi wanted to be involved in that. <laughs> People were forced to go in the military, were forced to fight an Iran-Iraq war, were forced to die. And, uh, you know, they, they weren't expecting people to come. So I immediately jumped in that opportunity. Yeah. And I walked into the, to the Iraqi recording center, and I, um, there was an American guy standing there. And I, I, I walked in, and I was 17 years old. I showed my ID, and uh, he looked at my ID, and he, he looked at me, and he's like, he's like, I'm sorry, man. He's like, we're taking 18 years old and above. You need to come back next year. And I, I just went back crushed at home. I didn't know what to do. I went back walking, and I'm looking. There's like three people. That's it. And I went back. There was a guy in my neighborhood that faked uh, fakes IDs. Uh-huh. And it's like it's not like an American ID. It's written by like, and, and it's like a plastic cover on top of it. So he faked my age. And he's like, dude, if I was you, I, I wouldn't go back the same day. <laughs> he's like, this guy. Wait a couple he's days. like, this guy's yeah. an American. It's hot. He'd probably be a different American tomorrow. <laughs> Just be patient, go back a different day. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, maybe they shut it down. Maybe, you know what? I'm going back. So I changed my shirt. I put a hat on. And I went back. And the problem wasn't many people for him to forget. And my hope was is it's too hot in Iraq. This dude probably gone. Different guy in there. And I walk in and it's the same American guy. <laughs> Brad. Fucking No, no. It's, it's the same American guy who was in charge who was oh, checking oh, IDs. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. And I, I was just like, I'm like, you know what? We're all Iraqis. You know, he's not going to recognize my face so i walked in and I, I showed him and he looked at me he was like he was like i thought you were like 17 this morning 
I said, oh, we had a birthday, and I just turned 18. He looked at my age, and he was like, H how did you do this? I said, I just went in, and I faked it. And he laughed, and he was, like, he was like, he's like, you went and faked it, and you did all this to come back? I said, yeah, I did. And he's like, okay, I'll cut you a deal. Go get one of your parents to sign this. Uh -huh. I'll let you through the door. And once you walk into that door, you get medically checked, you get a shipment date yep. to go trained by American Vietnam veterans in the northern Iraq. Vietnam and, and, veterans? Yeah, American yeah, Vietnam was, veterans. So we had a bunch of soldiers and a bunch of State Department people. So my one of my buddies, Fred Pyre, was actually up there in northern Iraq before the invasion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like him and about maybe 30 other dudes yeah. were in North. They, they had come through some other countries that we actually through Turkey. They weren't supposed to go through Turkey because Turkey told us to fuck off. But he and a bunch of State Department guys brought up, they like set up landing zones and started doing intel and brought in a bunch of fucking people to start training people. Uh, they brought a company called MPRI. NPRI. NPRI. That's the company. And they brought all these like uh, retired Vietnam veterans. Mm. And they brought them in like former SFs and former SEALs and former Marines uh, from the Vietnam era. And they brought them in there, you know, they were uh, in Budim and in, in Karkush, Iraq, which is near the Iranian borders. Um, and then once I walked her through that door, I got a shipment date. I got shipped. The second shipment, the, the second group that was supposed to follow got blown up by a car bomb. That's when things went really bad wow. in 2004. And immediately, um, there was nobody showing up to the recording center. So you got stuck with 150 Iraqi soldiers. And you don't have an actual army. All you have is ICDC, which is Civil Defense Corps, people who they hire locally from the cities to be in uniform. And most of these people are exposed because enemy knows where they live. And yeah, they live in the neighborhood. So it, it was like the first group of the Iraqi military was in your hands, 150 people going in that bus and uh you know we, we got off and it was hilarious as hell because these were american drill sergeants who are used to yelling at people and it, it was it was a mess because none of the people with me spoke english and and you know they were expecting a nice welcome and it wasn't you know it was a right. bunch of old marines telling you to get the hell out of the bus and do push-ups and <laughs> it, it was a very difficult experience and we were like sheeps that were just being let from one building to another and look as an american yeah. who went through that process here yeah. it's not any different <laughs> it's they were different they were assholes sure, yeah. to us here too it's part of the process yeah, yeah. yeah. last they time weren't, i flew into san antonio they yeah. were in the airport oh the yeah. guy was yelling at yeah uh, people at in civilian clothes in the airport clothes, yeah. yeah in civilian yeah. clothes in the airport yeah. and i asked you when you picked me up i was like <laughs> yeah. hey man is this normal oh yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it, it was in baggage they, claim we were yeah. inside baggage claim they were yelling at them they weren't picking on you Hard yeah. times breed hard men. That's yeah, what they believe. yeah, and I, I, I think truly they made the best Iraqi division to this day. The first Iraqi division is one of the best in the fight Iraq. Well, it's because it was know? guys that wanted to fucking fight, and yeah. not people who were poor and just looking for a paycheck. Because that's what it turned into over time. Exactly. A lot of guys joined the Iraqi military just because, hey, I, what the fuck else am I going to do? Yeah, and they you know did. I mean? They did something amazing where they brought three recruiting centers: Baghdad, Erbil, which is the north of Iraq, and they had a, another recruiting center in the south. And the first time Bakuba, where was in, in the history, hmm. um, Karakosh is actually above Bakuba. It's where we were being trained, hmm. um, near the Iranian, near Mendeley and all the Iranian borders mm -hmm. in the mountains area. Um, and they brought, like, what they did is they, they said, there's different ethnicities in Iraq. You know, there's not just Arabs or Muslims. We have Muslims, Yazidis, Shabak, uh, Assyrian, Christians, Christians yeah. Assyrians. It's a mix yep. of a lot of different ethnicities. So what they did, the American uh, instructors said we want each platoon to be mixed with like every ethnicity. And this has never been to Iraq, like in Iraq because Kurds fought with Kurds, Arabs fought with Arabs, mm -hmm. and that's how it been. And all of a sudden I was in a platoon that was Kurds, Arabs, Yazidis, people who are not in my religion or my ethnicity, and some of us didn't understand each other. We spoke different language. So when we speak Arabic, they speak Kurd Kurdish. Some of them <laughs> speak a uh, different language. And it, it was really amazing to see like how us as Iraqis came together and we were just fighting for Iraq. We we're not fighting for anything because we're all from different backgrounds. And when we went out, got trained, got sent out, um, I went, I got assigned to Al Ambar province and then from Al Ambar province, I got promoted. I was like an NCO as a sergeant. I came back and I was assigned to Haifa Street, which is um, two miles, the most dangerous two miles in the world during 2004 what do we call it route irish uh, no route irish is near buy up 
Okay, what's, that's, which, that's which a, one's Haifa? What do we call that? Uh, Haifa Street was just Haifa we, Street. We had a code name for it, though, didn't we? Um, I mean, they call it all kind of names. Alley, they call it like, like Death Route. They death call route, it, yeah, that might a, be it. A Sniper Alley. Yeah. Because the people, the nature of the people that lived in Haifa Street were majority Bath Party members, mm. people who worked in Saddam's intelligence. Yeah, yeah. They were armed. They had weapons already. Uh, some of them were Republican guards who were trained in, in Russia mm-hmm. during the Iran-Iraq war. So you weren't fighting an A-level Al Qaeda terrorists. You're fighting people who are at former military, and we were right at the recruiting station where we got recruited. So our job was to protect the recruiting center, and to make sure the recruiting center processed people on a daily basis, so we can increase the number of Iraqi soldiers. And uh, in the daily basis, we would have car bombs literally every single day blowing up at the checkpoint, while you have a, a line of people coming in. Sure. So the the attacks were so vicious because. A native Iraqi fighting side by side the Americans and makes the mission a lot more difficult for them because we're not Americans. We're, we're from Iraq. We know who these people are. Mm. We can tell from their age, from their language, from their body language. We know who these people are. We can look at somebody and say, you know what? You look like a former intelligent operative. You're not a normal citizen. And that's the difference that we had. So they were more, at that point, more vicious on us than they were on the Americans. Because they knew we would be like the complete hands that the Americans would use against them. So they figured that they wanted to scare people from being part of the military. So they started killing civil defense, civil defense corps, ICDC members who go home to their families on a daily basis. And they will just shoot him or behead him in, in front of somebody. Shit, and then, they, were, they were killing like uh, local leaders, judges, all kinds of shit. Anybody. Anybody that like had anything to do with the American Yeah, assassinations were literally happening like in the, in the hour. Yeah. And you walked in into that, and uh, one day I got my soldier, uh, one of my, my commander came in, and he said, uh, there, is, there, is a f- there is a 25 dead bodies in the end of Haifa Street. These were people who are applicants that just filled an application. Obviously, the public transportation works with the terrorists, and instead of them taking one route away from the dangerous area, and they're from outside of Baghdad. They don't know Baghdad pretty well. Mm-hmm. He drove them into Haifa Street. They took them off the bus, shot them, and laid the bodies in the end of Haifa Street. And they, they did that for a reason, because what they were trying to do is, is they were trying to capture one of us. They said, don't worry about catch, catching the ICDC guys. Let's capture an actual Iraqi soldier. They had him put that on TV. So that way, the recording center just shuts down. Now, how do you put that on TV? Do they have control? Al Jazeera. Oh, Al Jazeera. Okay. Yeah, Al Jazeera was the sponsor of terrorism in Iraq. What they do is they they have people that will rent uh, rent cassette or discs back then Uh to them, and they'll they'll Mm. put it out there. Gotcha. Yeah, they'll put it out there. The internet was slowly starting in Mm. Iraq, but Al Jazeera was one of the main... uh, Al Jazeera was was the sponsor of it. Al Jazeera didn't care. They they aired all... uh, terrorism operations in Iraq. So we, I went in that day, and I had about 29 of my soldiers and my battalion commander. And uh, we were ordered to go and pick up trucks, pick up the dead bodies, take them to the morgue, and, and move on. So as soon as we entered Haifa Street, Haifa Street was quiet. And that was not usual. Yeah, that's not good. And when we, we saw, like, quiet, roads are shut down. They don't want any cars coming in. We literally just looked, me and my... But to a commander at the time, we're like, it's either we're taking these bodies home, either we're going with them, because it's we're not going to get out of here. So we continued. We got into the bridge, and the bodies were placed at a certain place. It was like the Tigers River. They put the bodies there, and it's a downhill. You have to walk down. It's a baited ambush. To go. And uh, we left the three trucks with gunners in them, and we walked down to go. To the bodies. The bodies were fresh, still barely shot. But if, if you and, knew that, that this was trouble, why go down there? You didn't have any options. Because you got to, man. You, you, you were ordered to take those bodies out and take them to the morgue. We felt, we felt something was happening, mm-hmm. but we, we didn't know what, what they were up to that day. They would usually come out, they strike, and leave. At that day, they were not planning to do that. They were planning to come strike, run you out of ammo, and take you. It, as a military people... We knew that when you get an engage, there's a QRF that comes for you, a quick reaction force in the base ready to go that will come for you, or there's an Americans as well. So you're not afraid of being stuck. And, and we didn't have that feelings at all. We're like, we're afraid of what's going to happen, but there's no way we would be stuck here for an hour or an hour and a half. 
And uh, what was the plan that day is to capture one of us in, in uniform. And what they did is when we went in, as soon as we got to where we were, they placed IDs in High Fish Street. So in case if a QRF comes by, we would not leave. They would not be able to get to us. That would give them enough time for them to break us and try to pick us up. So as soon as we went in, RPGs flew into the trucks. We lost like half of our men immediately, like right in there. Most of it took cover under the bridge, uh, you know, columns, the, the, the columns that holds the bridge. Mm -hmm. And it went on for about an hour to about hour and a half. And at that point, you heard all your Q QRF was being shot coming to you. They were shot and IDs blow up on their face and they returned to base. And nobody was coming for you. And we got stuck. They're looking at each other. Half of my soldiers broke mentally. You couldn't go out to the river to drink water because they had a sniper that sat right above the ground. So if you made it one inch outside of that column, out of that concrete column, they'll put a bullet in you. Most of that guys were being hunted by a sniper, but we didn't see where he was. Where he was. And uh, we just sat down behind, and they figured they didn't have much time that they would just hit RPGs on it until we come out of it. And we had a stairs that goes up to the, to the bridge that we were above. And three soldiers' bodies were laid in there that tried to get up above the ground because mm -hmm. I try to control above ground sure. to have, a, to have a above the ground so I can see what's in front of me because I don't see how many they are, where they are, where mm -hmm. the sniper is located. And I sent three people, and the three people didn't make it up to the to – the, they died literally on the stairs. So I was looking. I'm like, it's, it's a lot of people. I didn't really count how many people I was losing at that point. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the people who are around me. I have a couple of Kurds who spend their whole entire life being smugglers and fought against Saddam, and, and these people had a cigarettes in their mouth while they fought. <laughs> they didn't care. They're, like, they're hard motherfuckers. Yeah, man. they were like, it's just another day in the, in, in the shit for us. And, um, <laughs> and I had a guy who, one of the Kurds I have was experienced, had a PKC. So me and him, we ceased fired. And we're like, we're at a point right now, we don't have enough ammo. They're trying to get close to us, which we can see. And um, we're, we're not going to engage until they come 15 meters. That's the deal. 15 meters, they enter that, we are going to shoot. If they don't, we're just going to sit here and chill. And at that point, the Americans realize that what's going to happen in the air. So they had to send their QRF across the other bridge from Baghdad to come from the other side of the river. So by the time the American came over, they cross. And once they saw the Americans, they run. Because they're only Rambos when it comes to, like, the Iraqis. But once they see, like, the first cavalry unit shows up, uh -huh. they ran away. They all disappeared. So when I came out, I, I was bleeding. I had a shrapnel above my right eye here. I was caught. And I had a shrapnel behind my knee, which I didn't feel none of them. I, I didn't realize I was shot at that point. I was bleeding, and I thought I was sweating. And I, I, I felt like I was scratched. Sure. But I didn't know it was a shrapnel that actually cut my eye. And... Um, What's so funny was um, an American medic, I kept trying to count my people, and I count, it's nine, nine soldiers that I have. And I, and I go back and I count again. And I'm like, no, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it right. And I count, and I'm like, where's our lieutenant? And they said, oh, we lost, we lost radio contact. He was behind one of the columns, and we don't know what happened. And they were talking to us during that firefight in the, in the radio. Uh -huh. So they were asking us to give up. And... Uh, I just looked and I was like, where's the lieutenant? They like, we don't know. And as I was coming out the hill, I saw there was like a traffic light and it's a column and it was a, a body with no head and uniform. And I'm looking close to the body. That was the body of my lieutenant. And they have captured him alive. Holy shit. And um, there was debate whether he gave up, whether he ran out of ammo. The, 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 we don't know what happened. The truth is. Um, most of us at that point, I had 16 bullet when I got out of the place. I had exactly 16 bullet. And I took one uh, towards the end, and I put it right here through my pen pocket. Because I, if I ran out, I didn't want to get burned. I didn't want to get beheaded. Now you're going to smoke yourself, I, right? I was just yeah. Yeah. put it and done. And that's yeah. my plan. Fuck and everybody that. with me, that was their plan. The Kurds were mm -hmm. like, I'll just turn that PKC upside down with the last bullet, and I'll shoot the last three. And done. And... Um, I came out at that point, and then I see the body, and I just realized, I'm like, that's, that's my commander. And uh, we heard them screaming. We heard screamings, and obviously, we didn't know what they were celebrating, but obviously, they were celebrating his, his killing. And um, an American medic Can kept... you see them, like, where the screams we are see, coming from? We, or, we see or them. Or you do? We, we see them, but not clear. They're behind walls. Ah. 
because the perfect that place they chose it for a reason that the place was just high ground walls and we're facing like we can't get them so the guy who designed it his name is Said Hitchum he was one of the most wanted terrorists in Baghdad he was a former um, Republican Guard colonel who was trained in Russia for like six years this guy was a, a genius when it comes to war tactics so he chose that place knowing that anybody will break in there and if anybody jumps in the river to run the sniper will just take care of them. Mm-hmm. So when I came out, the American medic came yelling, saying, hey, you're bleeding. And I said, no, it's not my blood. I, I treated a couple of people. And she said, no, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's a couple. Of, it's you who was bleeding. And I'm like, she was like, your eye is wide open. And when she said that, I, I put my hands right here. And I didn't feel my, my soft skin. <laughs> I felt like a lip that was right here. And once I felt it, I fell down. I felt all the pain in my body. Yeah. Literally, as soon as she told me, I looked down, and my pants was soaked, which I thought it was sweat. And I'm looking, it's all red. It's blood. So I'm looking, I'm like, I'm, like, I'm shot. And I didn't realize I got shot. I thought it was scratched because I jumped from a couple of places. And when she told me, I felt literally the pain. Every nerve pain I had, it just my brain connected with you're it. You're so filled with adrenaline at that and point. And right? I just laid down on the ground. She was like, just walk to there. I, I couldn't walk yeah. anymore. I was like stuck in there. So they carried me and they put me there and took me to the hospital. I went back to the unit. Um, so they left the shrapnel on my knee and they stitched me up and I was dying to go back to the unit to see what happened, who died, who was still alive. And I walked into the unit and I see my commander and I see people leaving through the, the gate. It's soldiers that we had that, that were not in the fight. But they have seen what the QRF happened to them. They came back with most of them dead in the trucks or were, were killed in, in, in place. And they heard what happened to us. 50% of that unit quit their jobs. Mm. They're like, I, they came here, I came here for a good life. I have kids. This is not going to end. We're not going to win. There's like 150 of you versus how many of them? They left. They started leaving. And I just sat in that room in my, in my barracks. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Like, if I go back home, they will probably just take me out on the street and kill me anyway. So if I go, what's, what am I going to accomplish if I go? And I just sat there, and I was, like, in a very depressed situation out of my life. You just lost your friends. You just tasted the first touch of that war, and they just showed you what they're up to. And it's a hard decision because, for me, it's I lived there my whole life. So the, my commander called me into the Iraqi Ministry of Defense. Um, he said, the Iraqi Minister wants to meet you guys. And I got promoted to a command sergeant major in the Iraqi military. Uh, this has never happened in the history of the Iraqi military. You were 19 at the I time? I was 19 at the time. This is, was a rank for someone who was about maybe 50 years old. But this would never happen in the Iraqi military because it's 500,000 soldiers today. Back then, it's 150 soldiers. Mm. Different situation. So I got promoted as a 19 years old and being a command sergeant major sounds like a joke, but inside of me, I was not a 19 year old. I, I was the one I man that been in the war, seen everything. And uh, my commander said, do you want to go back to Harvest Street? Literally about a week. And I'm like, I'll go back today if I have to. So we, we gathered all the ICDC in Baghdad and we encountered Harvest Street. And we captured some of the people that, that were in the fight. Some of them ran away. We came back, and then the Iraqi, the, the Iraqi commander that I had uh, called me in, and he said, the American Special Forces have requested you to go and be the command sergeant major for the Iraqi Ministry of Defense, which is equivalent to the Pentagon. So I, I went there, and, and um, my mission was totally different. I had soldiers there who were just barely recruited, I started securing the place, and the job was <clears throat> to have 50, so it's outside of the green zone, it's attached to the green zone, it's not completely an American area, and my job was to protect the Iraqis and the Americans that worked in the building. 50 American advisors will build the infrastructures of the Iraqi military, so you can have a, a command base or uh, build that military and have it expand, and um, at the same time, uh, protect the front of the checkpoint of that building, make sure it's safe because it sits next to checkpoint one. I, I, I walked in there. It was so interesting. There was like about 4,000 Iraqi employees in there. And I walked in there and I was like, here I came thinking this is an easy mission. And like literally all the bad people that I can smell in Iraq was already inside of the building. 
because at that point the 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 terrorist organizations were so terrified of Americans from 2003 to 2004. And the reason why, because they thought Americans were very high tech. They can tell, they can get information. Mm-hmm. About a year, they realize, oh, Americans actually don't know a crap. <laughs> they don't know who we are because we don't have a digital database in mm-hmm. Iraq. So you can't pull someone in a background. Yeah. You can't. And they're like, great. We just form political parties and we can be part of the government. We can share them the power, yeah. let them go with it, and we will get to know more about them. So what happened was is all these terrorist organizations started pushing political parties to go and be part of the government. So Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, Al-Naqshabendis, which is, these are terrorist organizations that you're not familiar with, unless in, 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 only Al-Qaeda and ISIS, of course. Back then, it was the Islamic State. Mm. They, they existed. And um, Batakor, which is the Iranian proxy operatives, these were like former intelligence, op- you know, like foreign intelligence operatives, mm. came Shalmani. from Iran, Jaysh al it, yeah. it was, everybody was inside. And I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking like, I'm smiling with, you know, my American counterparts. I'm like, so you want me to protect the building? From the front, so bad guys don't come in, while all the bad guys are inside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, what the hell am I gonna do here? So I was like, you know, looking at it, there was car bombs blowing up in the checkpoint every single morning, and these guys are going inside. So the mission became politically, you know, a critical. At that <clears throat> point, a minister from the Ambar province, because the cake in Iraq got caught, based if you're a Sunni or Shia or mm-hmm whatever your background is. So we got a minister from the Ambar province where the Marines were heavily engaged against 99% bad guys. We got a minister out of those bad guys to come in and be there. He brought 200 men from the Ambar province to be his security guards. And I'm sitting there watching all that going into my building and I'm looking, I'm like, I don't think I can hold this building. And I am looking at my American counterparts. I'm like, do you see what I'm seeing? And they're like, no, we don't. We don't, we don't know who's who. We're all about inclusivity here. Yeah. So it, it came to the point where the U.S. intelligence at that point have approached me about working for them as an intelligent asset. Because the U.S., the General Petraeus at the time have assigned a liaison team to station inside of the building. And their job is to brief him on the daily basis about what's going on inside, what's who's taking over who. And you're talking about these terrorist organizations, they're not all in the same team. So assassinations were happening on a daily basis. So when someone get assigned to a certain position mm-hmm. and the other team don't like you, that person goes home, he's dead. The assassins already took care of him. So if you were an Iraqi nationalist who cared about your country, as soon as you left that door, you're dead. If you don't belong to anybody, you're dead. So it was like a, a moment. So the U.S. intelligence have approached me about making sure that I, I identify and cross-reference intelligence for them about whatever is going on, the groups, because this was a harder for, thing for them to understand who is who. So the intelligence officers who worked in the inside, it was a Colonel, Colonel John Burke who was in the film, and, um, and his staff, military intelligence unit that came in and said, and there was about 20 people, and their job was to be there 24 hours. But having someone being there 24 hours when you have 200 men from the Ambar province there all the time it was a little too dangerous because you don't have a qrf for them you don't have anything these are americans are not supposed to be here but the their military and their command ship want them to be there so pretty much you could say the u.s military at the time was looking to sacrifice 20 americans just to know what the hell's going on and i felt bad because once you in our culture once you work with somebody or you fight in their side it's a code of honor you know he's in your team henry v uh, right. They really believe in that shit over there. And it, and it really, those Americans became a team. They became my team. They became my responsibility. And one night, one of the leaders of that 200 men who came from the Ambar province showed up at 11 o'clock at night, which he was not supposed to be there. Every American eva- get out of the building at 4 p.m. They leave to their green zone, and the Iraqis go to the opposite side. This guy showed up with about 150 men, all armed without the guy they were protecting in the middle of the night. Uh, prior, they brought a truck uh, that lift T-walls. So the whole entire building, as you see in the film, is actually covered by a nine-foot concrete barriers. No cars can come in. Nothing can come in. And um, they came in, so we're like, if they came in, they, they can never leave this building. Mm-hmm. 
only through the gate that we have that takes them back. And what they have did is there was a road, which we were next to the Tigers Rover. They have bought a truck that actually can lift a T-wall. If it lifts that T-wall, just drop it. And they have armored vehicles that were given to them because once you're a member of the Iraqi government at that point, at that, that level, right. they give you like an armored vehicle. And we weren't sure what they were doing. So once we realized there was a truck that actually lifted you all, we asked, like, what is this truck for? They said, we're moving furniture to the minister office. And they have the authority to do so. What was happening is that these guys were fighters from the Anbar province, were members of Al-Qaeda. They have never had the opportunity to see an officer in the rank of a major in the U.S. military walking on his own with a 9 millimeter. This was the only place in Iraq where you can get hold of someone between a major to a full bar colonel walking on his own crossing just by himself. These guys were been down in the Anbar province. Mm -hmm. If they take an American out of that building, the whole entire war in the Anbar province would change because now they have an American in their hand. They do have other Americans as hostages. They have other KBR workers or mm -hmm. foreign workers, but... This game changed if you get someone who's in uniform, who has a clearance, who is high rank, that changed the whole game. So what they were looking to do is they have spotted an officer that stayed late. He was in the country for 10 days, was not briefed correctly by his previous partner, and stayed there until 11 using the computer. They spotted him in the second floor, which we didn't know he was supposed to leave at 4. We had only those Americans that we protect mm -hmm. with everything we got that operates in the building in the first floor. So when I got that in the call on the radio, I ran in. My advice by the U.S. intelligence is to evacuate the Americans immediately in the first floor. As military, we pay attention to detail. We always double check. So I send my, my team. We, we try to evacuate the Americans. And I said, a couple of you guys go to the second floor. Just clear it. Just make sure there's no one in there. Even though we know there's nobody, it should be in there. And they went in, and then as soon as they went in, I got a call on the radio, and my soldiers were like, all the locks to the back of the building are broken, and there's an American sitting in the second floor. And they said they have broken all our locks oh, to shit. the back of the building. It's broken. There's no chains anymore. They just broke it. And we immediately see where the doors goes is where the T-wall or the truck is. So we immediately, that, like one second, we realized that once that American leave the building or leave that wall, it's done. It's over. It's game over. Because they have Iraqi Ministry of Defense ID card, which is Iraqi government ID card. They can actually pass American checkpoints and they will never be searched. Wow. So their plan was so well crafted. Mm -hmm. The people who were conducting that plan were very high level operative. The guy who was leading, he was known by Sabah Delamy. We don't know who the hell he is. He was um, a former member of Al Fidayn, which is Saddam's suicide fighters which we didn't know about later until I provided the intelligence to the U.S. intelligence. So what happened was I got that officer immediately and I ran him over to the opposite side. I couldn't run with him. I made the phone call. The to U.S. The, officer. To the U.S. officer. Yeah. We immediately evacuated him. Got everybody out. We made the phone call to the U.S. intelligence and immediately General Casey and General Petraeus put a travel ban to the MOD. We never had any American walked in for three days. They stayed out where they came from. And they sat down trying to figure out how are you going to operate building a new Iraqi government or a new Iraqi army with terrorists being in the same building as you. This was new for them. So they sat down, they were like, what do we do? And they called me after those, before that ban was lifted. 72 hours, I think, they called me. And they said, go out to the green zone. A truck is going to come pick you up. And you're going to get into this truck and th this is an intelligent collection team, and, and we'll meet there. So I went out of the building. I went to the green zone, and, uh, and a, a, a civilian truck pulled over, and there was a female and a male in it, and uh, civilian clothes, guns, you know. Like in Iraq, you don't know who these contractors, you don't know who the hell they are. Right. So to me, they, they were like introduced themselves from a three-letter agency. As an Iraqi, uh, this sounds like ABC mouse for me. When he say I work for whatever, I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means. If you say I work for, you know, a three-letter agent, I don't know what the hell that means. You yeah, know? Yeah. As an Iraqi, I don't know. I'm like, who do you work for again? I was like, so all I knew was KBR, the people who fed me back then. <laughs> I was like, you work with KBR? And they're like, no, no, we don't do food, man. And, and, uh, and really, they, they showed up, and they took me, and they took me to a secure compound. And I sat in a building, a table. They introduced themselves, a couple members from OGA. 
and a, a member was from the Defense Intelligence Agency. And they said, and they said, Hamidi, we, we flew from the Anbar province. That's where we operate. This is our area of operations. And they said, the person you're looking at is actually an interest because we've been looking to identify these individuals. And the Marines are heavily engaged. The city of Lombard province is evacuated. We don't have anybody there. We don't have any leads, basically, on any terrorists or any groups. And we want you to work for us. And I, at that time when they said, do you want to work for us? I'm like, I don't know how many side jobs I can do besides <laughs> being in charge of the most dangerous building in the world. But... Do you get more money for all those jobs? No, I don't, I don't get paid for that. <laughs> That's the sad part is that I don't get paid. You know, I was yeah. doing just my job as an Iraqi soldier. So in the history of spies, there was never a command sergeant major who worked as a spy. It's never happened. So I was like, how do I command my unit who I was struggling on a daily basis? And at the same time, spying on people who are really big heads. They're, these are not regular terrorists. These are the leadership of these organizations. They'll snatch you if they want to. Right. So when I looked at that, I said, what do you guys want me to do? And I'm, I'm telling them, I said, why don't you guys go detain them? Go, go get them right now. They're in the building. I'll help you. And they said, no, we don't want you touching them. And I was freaking out. And they were like, look, we know you're, you're a 19-year-old. Sit down. We're going to explain this to you. And they said, this, we want to find out where these people in the Umbar, where are they coming from? There's a bigger picture than this. So they asked me to go into the building and try to identify every single person in that group. Can you? I can, because they got their Iraqi MOD ID cards, which they, they would use mm -hmm. going back and forth. So I went into the Iraqi personal department. There was a, some lady there who had a crush on me that I talked to, and I was like, hey, can, can you access in the computer to see what, what information you have on these individuals? And she pulled the whole roster. And I looked at the roster. They used their real names. I saw the last names. Same last name, same everything. Like last name is uh, tribal names. Tribal so names. So exactly we'll go by where they came from originally. First name, father name, <clears throat> grandfather, and la and tribal yep. name. So we collected, but the target was that leader who was leading that group. His name was Sabah Delamy. So I, I immediately pulled him, and they they provide a blood type, everything about the b person, and I took that b back that information with a fingerprint. And the U.S. intelligence, which nobody knew in Iraq at that time, they had got some database hide hide yeah. of some of the people that were loyal to Saddam the people mm -hmm. who actually worked in the higher intelligence agencies or the suicide uh, squads for Saddam and they did a match and that leader came back a member of a Fidayan which is Saddam suicide fighter so when that information became clear I was told to figure out more information into how they switch shifts when do they go home how do they go home which vehicles they use and at the time, the U.S. intelligence uh, sticked a couple tracking devices in their vehicles. And they left. Once they switched shift, they went back to the Umbar province. And four days later, I got a phone call from the agent. She said, Sabah has been detained with, like, everybody that was in his cell. How many people and, was that, would you it was estimate? A, it was a, I have, to be honest with you, the people that I watched left, it was a 25 Mm. And God only knows how many of them were in it's there. It's got to be a couple hundred, though. So like people overall. got detained, and the, the weapons they found, the caches they had under, the, 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 the <laughs> basements they had built, it's like a barracks of Al-Qaeda. It's where they hid. And they arrested him about where Gurma, it's called Gurma Fallujah, and there was like a half a mile of mortar rounds and explosive or whatever they had in them. So that made change the battle for, for the Marines there. They got located. This is in 2005, right? 2005. Yeah, so it's the Battle Fallujah that, yeah. that yeah. everybody knows about. Yeah, yeah, where Marine, yeah. The Marines were heavily engaged for quite a bit of time there. They, he, he, he identified, like, football fields worth of weapons that were potentially going to be used against them in that fight. And really, at that point in your life, you look at it <clears> and you'd be like, I'm, I'm, just, a, I'm just a freaking 19 years old. <laughs> and I, I, I went back after that, and it became from a favor to a job. Right. At that point, I officially became an intelligent asset for the U.S. intelligence. At 19 years old. 19 years old. I was like the router, like your internet router mm -hmm. that everybody hooks into. So at that point, I was working with the three different intelligent teams, three different agencies. Everyone has a different mission. One is locating terrorists. One wants, wants to understand the politics of what's happening and who wants to take more power. And others were identifying more bad people 
who were involved in schemes and stealing money of our government. So it was a mess to what you were providing. And my job at that point was identifying every organization and their sub-organizations inside of the building and provide that to the U.S. intelligence. And once the U.S. intelligence gets a formation that mm -hmm. could be false, because sometimes they're smart, they'll put false information out there to see if you're catching it. And I would cross-reference and try to verify if it's real or not based on what the politics are going on. And what's so interesting was good Iraqi officers would leave the building in about minutes they'll die. And you'll have a guy who lives in a terrible neighborhood full of Al-Qaeda, goes home every single day, leaves at five, and no one touches him. So that's how you started identifying guys that were bad, right? Exactly. Like whoever went home to these shitty neighborhoods and yep. didn't get clipped on the way, like that yep. guy, like because obviously something's going on. Because neighborhood, it tells you something. If he lives next door to Al-Qaeda guy, and he's not being shot. Yeah. And he goes home at five. He, he doesn't have to worry about getting dark. We, where you can see the national Iraqi officer, the ones who are good people, were fighting for the country. Uh, they're hiding. They're waiting until eight o'clock so they can leave. Because or they would afraid. stay away from their families for like they three or six away months for at a time. Yeah. A period of time. Yeah. And that's how I lost my t one of my team members. And um, they, it was a confusing moment because you had to, you had very little time and you have to identify. But we put a list of who's the majority. At the time, all the other players, like Battle Corps, the Iranians, these were not a threat to, as a, as a physical threat to the Americans in the building or to the, to the Americans in Iraq. These were just people collecting intelligence against you. The threats who were people who are members of Al-Qaeda and, and the Islamic State and the Naqshbandis because these are radicals. These are religious background uh, organizations. And... Um, you were busy looking at these guys all day. So we located a guy who is, um, who made our number one on the list. Mm -hmm. And he was also orig originally from the Ambar province. Came back to the Iraqi military, and he was calling the Americans occupiers. Like, he, w he didn't like the Americans, so why the hell you were part of the new Iraqi military? And he worked at the Iraqi Joint Operation Center, which is a very important location. It's where all these American intelligence operatives are, uh, collecting info, liaison teams, and... We have people who will go through that hallway. So what's so interesting is that the people, the individuals that will come into that building from the American side are not normal people. You'll have like four-star generals. You'll have <laughs> Congress members who are traveling from the United States coming to America to visit the MOD. Mm -hmm. So imagine my feelings every time I have a very high-profile visitor come into the building knowing behind this door there is actually an Al-Qaeda fighter that just could pull a gun and do whatever. So every time someone visited, I will use one hallway and all my soldiers will shut down every door and lock them and have soldiers stand behind and in front of it. And if anything goes down, I have enough time to evacuate people. And some of the Secret Service guys knew the process. They'll communicate with, them, with me every time they come in. I mean, you're talking about the names. I had John Dempsey, who was the, the John of the Chief of Staff here in America. I had... General Betrayas, John Abazit, who's a four-star. General Sanchez, three-star. General, uh, I mean, General Gorelli, name it. Who do you, Congress members? Yeah. Um, I actually had to walk one of the Congress members to the bathroom <laughs> because when I walked him into the, to, to that hallway, it was like he asked me where the bathroom, and I'm like, I don't have any safe bathroom right now for you. Yeah. But give me five minutes, I'll make it safe. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, Jeez, and I took him to the bathroom, and I actually waited with him. Yeah. And as we escorted him in and out, he's like, he's like, oh, you guys, you guys don't have to come with me. And I'm like, trust me, we do. We do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do. So I end up doing that in the daily basis. But we have this individual we were watching in that room. And um, I had an eye on him. I had other intel sources that were watching him sure. inside of that room. And they, I got information, which I had as an intel source provided to the U.S. intelligence on him because I had an eye on him. And they said, oh, he disappeared every 45 minutes. He's gone. We don't know where the hell he goes. So thank God, as a command sergeant major of the Iraqi MOD <clears throat> at the time, I have made a rule as no one smokes in the building. I'm sure Daniel would know about Iraqi oh, yeah. smoking. They smoke everywhere. Like, everywhere all the time. I mean, yeah. if, if you walk into an Iraqi <clears throat> room, it looked like a hookah bar. So yeah. why no smoking in the building? Because it would, it would hide people? Or? So the excuse I use is that you have American counterparts with you, and they don't like that. Mm. So if you want to smoke, go to the balcony. Mm. And we had cameras where we can see everybody. 
in that balcony. You can see who's talking to whom, shit like so that. So we can see like who's communicating. We, mm. Or at the same time, we don't have them smoke there because actually the Americans don't like to, to people smoking around mm. them inside of the building. So I, I use that excuse. And they all were hating on me, you know, like, like this 19-year-old punk till us can't smoke <laughs> sure. in the building. And I, I let them go in there. And I, they said he disappears for a smoke break every 45 minutes. So I, I, it was easy for me. Before I notified the U.S. intelligence, I went to the footage to look into where the hell in the balcony is. So I, I, I reviewed eight hours of footage, and I'm looking. I'm like, he's, he's not in the balcony. He's not smoking. He's obviously not smoker because he would have been in here. He's not smoking. Sure. But I went back to my soldiers, and they're like, yeah, no, no, he does. He disappears for 45 minutes. Every 45 minutes, 15 minutes of that hour, he's somewhere. So I, I started utilizing more sources as I notified the U.S. intelligence of his activity. And they said, you know, we have visitors in there. We have Americans. Um, find out where the hell he's going. And we find out he goes to his locker room because he's not a full-time soldier like myself. He comes from, nine, like, you know, 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. he, he comes in civilian clothes because nobody goes home in uniform. He changes into uniform, does his job, and he leaves. And he goes, obviously, to his locker room where he had his uniform. So I went in, and there was lock on it. So I notified the U.S. intelligence. And they're like, what time does he leave? I said, he leaves at 5. He, he's at the building. They said, well, at 510, you're going to break that locker. And we don't care what the outcomes are. We have visitors there. We have important people going through. We want to know if this guy have anything in there. And I'm like, I'm, I'm securing the checkpoint. There's nothing he has in there. What could he have? A gun? Whatever. So I, he left. I had to buy a lock because in Iraq, we have one company that makes locks. We don't, and it's all, they're all similar. <clears throat> so sometimes the key jams. Okay. So we bought the same size, same looking lock. Yeah. And we said, we're just going to lock it. He was going to think that the lock is, is not great and it's just jammed. And I took the cutter and I cut the lock. It was a small lock. And I bought the same size, same color, same thing. And I clicked it. I opened the locker and I was fast. You know, I, I didn't want anybody to see me because there were people on duty. Sure. Iraqi officers. I don't know who they work for. Yeah, yeah. And I just checked the pockets. There was nothing, and I, I just moved the uniform, and I was just really about to shut down the locker because I was nervous. I was not to be supposed to be seen there. Sure. And I saw a back, like a little double back, and uh, I tried to move it, and it was like a little on the heavy side. So I put both of my hands, and I was like thinking in my head, what's going through my head? I'm like, you know what? I'm sure that intel officer is going to ask me if I have checked the back because at that point I, I knew like everything they have asked me for the last – two years working for them. So like, I knew what counter questions they would ask. And I mean, I'm like, I'm going to check the bag before they ask me, even if I check the bag. I'm going to look into every pocket so that way they have full report of what's happening. So I took the bag and put it down the ground. I just slammed in the ground. I opened the bag, and as soon as I opened it, there was a suicide belt full of C4. Holy shit. And I'm looking in my head. I'm like, was this attached to the locker? If it's attached, maybe the locker's going to blow up on my face. Yeah, no shit. Maybe the back. And I just <clears throat> slammed the bag in the ground. And I'm just looking like my, the blood in my face literally just went back to my toe like, <laughs> yeah. in, in two seconds. <laughs> and I couldn't feel my heart anymore. I swear, I couldn't feel my, my heart beating anymore. I was just like froze. And I look, and there was a, the suicide built. It was built out of his military belt. He has a military belt, this stick that we wear in the Iraqi military. Yeah, it's webbing, web belt, yeah. With the official uniform, <clears throat> and he had wrapped it in pockets. He had wrapped it in pockets around it, and it was like a, a good amount of, of C4 in like it. Like how big of an uh, amount? I, I mean, you're you talking per, per block. It was pockets. You can say each, each pocket was about this big. Oh, shit, dude. And I, I'm looking, and I... <laughs> And the question is going through my head. This was my responsibility. This is my checkpoint. This guy went through my checkpoint every single day, and we were watching him. And I looked in the middle of the, the back. It was a bunch of cigarettes smashed, like a pile of tobacco and uh, bags of cigarettes. And what was happening is they had a special factory they will cut the cigarettes in half, and they will make a space because he comes in every single day for the last whatever years. Uh -huh. And they would put small amounts every single day, and he would go through the pedestrians because we couldn't afford to have two canines. We had one that only searched vehicles. So he would go through the pedestrian line. And in the pedestrian line, it's people and, you know, x-ray machines, as you saw in Iraq. They will search him, mm. and you look at it, it's just a cigarette box. 
Yeah. If you open it to cigarettes, unless you actually remove the cigarette, then you realize it's a have a cigarette. And that was not seen. We didn't know. <coughs> and he has probably spent like six to nine months bringing amounts every single day as he go. And he was building it. Whoever was going to wear it, him or someone else, who they were going to use it against, I mean, you don't know. That same year, guess who we had in the building? Who? Mike Pence. Who's oh, now, shit. Who's now? The vice president, yeah. Vice president. We had people who came back then who was part of the U.S. You know, government who would come yeah. to visit as they were visiting Iraq. So any Congress member, any, and we're looking at, like, who was he going to use this against? That's my interest. Like, was it a four-star? Was it, who, who were they planning? What are they thinking? Mm -hmm. And when I hit the emergency button, because there were Americans right behind the wall, immediately my face got seen. By who? By people who were on duty in that room. Okay. Which I don't know who they are. They're people, they choose certain officers who are on duty. Uh, phone calls immediately were made. Um, they, I, I went from being the 19-year-old punk who was given him a hard time as the command sergeant major in the building to saying this is a U.S. spy who's working for them. And all the intentions of all these organizations just went on you. I hit the emergency body, evacuated. The whole mess just went out. Went, everybody went off their way. I went back and then, you know, the U.S. intelligence members, they said, you know, they said, you got to leave, man. You got to get out. And as a, as a soldier, that, that's not easy for you. Mm -hmm. As an Iraqi, as a code of honor to your team members who are fighting with you, who is going above and beyond for you, I just couldn't take off that uniform and leave it. I'm like, leave where? To stuck in a base? I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm here with my soldiers. I am around all my team members. I'm, I'm not uh, an intelligence source that goes home where they can shoot me in the head. I don't go home. I've been in this building for like three years. I've never been home. I'm stuck in this environment. What are they going to do? And they're like, if we were you, we're going to leave. And I stayed. And I, that was the biggest mistake I, I made with my whole life because um, I ended up costing one of my team members his life. And I sat there, um, and, and from that moment, I was collecting intelligence, being in my normal day, and one of my team members hadn't been home about, about like, a few months. He's like, I, I bought a couple couple things from the px i want to take them home i want to see my kids i miss them so i have at that point the u.s intelligence have provided me an id cards for me and all my team members to use different exits and different entrances. so we don't go out of, like what they do out of the mod because all the assassins are really outside of the door sure so if you leave if they would ever see me leave people will make a phone call my assassins will be right in the car waiting for me outside and they'll just shoot me and go and that's how many iraqis died in that building I mean, every day we'll have a black sign. You know, when someone dies in Iraq, uh -huh. it's a black sign. You'll come to the MOD and it's full of black signs. People died, officers who left home and never came back. And um, so we would use the checkpoints for the Americans through the green zone. We will enter the green zone and then we'll, we'll choose checkpoint 14, checkpoint 11, whatever, and get out. So my, my things I thought was secure. And my team member said I was going to go see my family. And we didn't realize at that time that all these organizations have put their efforts aside and started looking at you. How are they going to get rid of you? And that's the mission. So they were watching every single member that I was connected to. And he left, and it's exactly 14 minutes. He left the checkpoint. And he got shot in the head with two bullets. And um, when we found out, I got, like, the, the call, like, an, an hour later, and they like, there's a dead bodies there, and uh, there's ID cards, and I went there. He didn't make it home. And um, it, it was a rough time, and that was, like, a message letting you know that we're here, and uh, we are going to wait. You know, like, how long is it going to take that we will come, we'll come get you? And, and that what the... What the struggle was for me is that it became personal for me. I don't want to leave. I want to stay. But I was costing my team members their lives. I would cost them, each one of them, their lives before I leave. So, now, do they know who you are and your name? 
at that point they don't know what family I come from. Okay, yeah, because that, that was that was my that's where I'm leading with this is is yeah. Did they try to go and kill your family? So, so that's that was actually the best part. The U.S. intelligence have uh, played a huge part in that. We have uh, cell phones in Iraq called Arakana. Like you guys have Verizon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have one one company back then. It's called Arakana. And my when I worked for the U.S. intelligence in 2005. Their advice was do not ever use the cell phone. Mm. Do not communicate with your family because they have people works in the phone company. Mm. And they, if they knew your <laughs> phone number, which they all knew, they can track who you're calling. They can track who you're talking to. They can get recording of those conversations. So I did not have any communications with my family from 2005 to 2008. Jeez. A period, it was like you could not talk to them. And at the time, my tribal name was not clear to them. It was never used okay. in the Iraqi military. So they couldn't figure out what exactly my last name was. And once they do, they can look at the area. They can ask around. They were searching all over, trying to figure out if they can catch one member of my family, I'm compromised, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I can never, because that's the style back then. If you are trouble and they can't get you, they'll find your daughter, your kid, mm -hmm. your wife, whoever, <clears throat> and compromise you and you're done. Or when they kill you and they kill your family. And you don't have any interest working for the U.S. intelligence after that if they kill one of your family members. Right. And uh, they looked everywhere, and it was just like this unknown puzzle for them that it's where this guy is spying on us, but he's not a civilian. He's a soldier. He's in a higher position. He's protected. And we don't know how we're going to get rid of him. We don't know who his family is. So they kept looking in the wrong areas. Mm. Uh, my phone calls were strictly... Uh, to people in the base. I, I don't talk to anybody. I don't talk to friends. I don't talk to anybody. Um, perhaps I had one of my family members got sick, yeah. which I needed to see. They sent someone with a laptop, and they used, like, Yahoo Messenger to, for me. used through the Internet to talk to them. Now, are, are your, your parents proud of you for what you're doing at this point, or nobody, are they afraid? Nobody in my family or life or friends or anybody knew what I was doing. There was about maybe 10 people that worked in my team that knew exactly what, what I was doing in the military, and nobody knows what I, what, what I was doing and what my job was. When or did they find out? Oh, maybe my family? Yeah. Uh, just in the last three years. Like three years ago? Yeah, three years ago when they find out exactly. You're who fucking they, kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They, they, they looked, and you know, some of them arrived in America, and they're like, what, what is that terrorist whisper thing like? They're like, no why? way. Yeah, because my book went out, and then, you know, uh, I think my brother, like, sent me a message. He's like, what is that? Because I saw the terrorist whisper, and I saw, like, a yeah, yeah, picture yeah. in it. And it says you work for the U.S. intelligence. I'm like, yeah, I do. And it, it went awkward, you know, because you've never been in their life. You never went to functions. <clears throat> they thought you just didn't give a damn about them. So I lost all these years. I, I mean, I'm talking about I left. My sisters were not married. Now my sisters have 16 and 17-year-old kids. And I, I, I never was part of them. I don't know who they are. They don't know me. Uh, they only see pictures of me. And uh, th there was a sacrifice with that job. And you had to be, you, you knew the outcomes of it. <clears throat> you know, me going into that place was, or going into a job like that, I knew the outcome of it was me dying. There was no two ways. One plus one is two. I was going to die. Um, making communications with them, not only putting them in danger, I can put myself in danger. I can cause them harm. So it was an awkward relationship. You know, they didn't see you for years. You weren't there for them during their good times. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people today will look at the terrorist whisper thinking it's a cool thing. Oh, wow, you faced Al-Qaeda undercover. Uh, no. I, I'm walking with a bunch of dead names. To this day, you know, people I see in my dream that I haven't seen 15 years ago, that died 15 years ago, um, lost family members, uh, can't talk to the rest of the family members uh, because you, you might not trust them enough, even though they're in Iraq, but I don't know who they are now. Right. Uh, I knew them 20 years ago, but not today. Uh, the biggest question I have for you yeah. during all of this, because obviously we have the hindsight of it now. Yeah. Do you know why the Americans are there? Do you know that they're looking, quote unquote, for weapons of mass destruction? Uh, are you aware of that? And then, then in turn, living there, having the information that you have, 
do you know that there isn't weapons of mass destruction in the country? Uh, the, the truth is, this has been a, such a conspiracy theory here in America, you know, and especially in the politics side, you know, because... Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Here in that, America, you know, Republicans and Democrats like to blame each other. And, uh, you know, I have nothing to do with this. So what, I, what happened is, is that what I know, based on the information that I knew, that Saddam had a goal of establishing weapons of mass destruction. Saddam mm -hmm. had used chemical weapons against the Kurds before. Saddam always, as a dictator, have looked for a massive power so he can stay in, in power. And since 1993, when Israel are striked mm. our nuclear reactors mm. in Iraq, Saddam had always had that goal. The truth is, is that he had the project, he had the idea, so he, he, he wanted to have weapons of mass destruction, but they were not developed enough or finished. And what had happened here is that the U.S. intelligence were 100% sure Saddam had weapons of mass destruction because that information, you have to know where that information came from. Mm -hmm. It came from Saddam Senal Law, who escaped Iraq, went to Jordan, met with the CIA and said, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. I think it was the husband of her oldest. Yeah, it's his, his, his oldest daughter, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, but it's his son-in-law. Yeah. And <clears throat> the, you know, the CIA, of course, wanted to verify that. And later on, this son-in-law came back to Iraq. Saddam tricked him, said, I forgive you, just oh, come yeah. back. Came back and really, they oh, yeah. killed him. So the CIA had that idea that there's weapons of mass destruction being developed in Iraq. So you can't blame mm. them. They have to go to work. There's weapons of mass destruction being developed in Iraq. The Iraqi, uh, there, at the time, there was a former Iraqi intelligence officer who escaped out of Iraq, who lived, who lived in Germany, known, but known by the name Al-Janabi. So how does the U.S. intelligence confirm there is a weapons of mass destruction? This guy actually worked at the, in the military facilities. He had the access to be mm. there. Al-Janabi was working at McDonald's in, in Germany. Yeah. The CIA I think went he there. Was, he was the asset they called fastball, right? Is yep, that right? yep. Mm -hmm. His name is Rafid Al-Janabi. <clears throat> They went there, they met with him. They never understood the, the emotional side of our culture. They went in immediately like, we just need to get information. There's a lot does, of hyperbole. Does he have over there. weapons of mass destruction? Al Janabi, they didn't realize that Janabi, his brother, was executed by Saddam. Yeah. It means emotionally, he wants to get back at Saddam with anything he can, <clears throat> and he works at McDonald's. He has nothing right. that he can do. So he said, yes, there was a weapons of mass destruction. Mm. And they said, well, do you have any maps? He said, absolutely. Put a paper. I will put the maps for you. Because he knows the facility so well. He actually gave them maps of exactly where the weapons are developed. And they are true military facilities. But did, was the program developed enough? That's what they missed. He gave them all this information. At the time, the CIA director, if I was in their shoes, mm -hmm. I would have believed there was a weapons of mass destruction. The president of the United States back then was a brief that there was a weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. So they fell, they messed up that they did not understand the motive behind Rafael Janabi giving them to say there is a weapons of mass destruction because that guy hated Saddam. He just wanted to get rid of him any way he can. And he now he sees that there's an interest from the U.S. intelligence, the U.S. government, and he... He, ca he, ca he caught into that and gave him that interest, and that's how the whole story with weapons of mass destruction, were their weapons of mass destruction? No. Were there a program? Yes. Uh, Saddam has always had those equipments. Um, there was a, a lot of under-the-table negotiations between Saddam and Syria or Iran, which makes sense because um, we heard that these equipments when the American inspectors, if you remember what they used to send inspectors to search Iraq mm -hmm. during Saddam, mm -hmm. um, the inspectors, which is, I, I saw some of the inspectors when I was in Iraq under Saddam, would come in, they will mm. go to military base and they'll dig in the ground. Like, it's so stupid. Like, do you think he would really hide him in the base? Yeah. And no, what I they heard- had, They had like fucking MiG yeah. fighter jets buried in the desert. Oh yeah. And like, they like- He's not gonna put weapon, WMD He's not gonna put weapons and mass destruction in, in the base. And yeah. they, they will come in, they'll <clears> dig a hole. It's just, it's just a crap. And what I heard basically, uh, <coughs> actually from a neighbor, who his brother-in-law was an intel officer who was in charge of escorting the the the, uh, the U.S. inspectors, and he's like, he's like, oh yeah, the, those dumb heads are looking in the ground, but they're not in the ground; they're on trucks moving on the road mm. 24 hours. Wow. 
And uh, and you know uh, you know for me I just heard that information I pretended back then I didn't yeah. hear it and, like, and then yeah. some, at some point uh, in 2005 uh, U S forces stopped these convoys of trucks and the inside of them had been it was like a series of trucks that were armored and shit and the inside of them had been bleached like with very strong chemicals yeah. to get rid of certain we don't know what it was yeah. but chances are it was probably like mustard gas and shit like that because that's yeah. what they used on the Kurds back in the day so, yeah. how, so how come <clears throat> this isn't more talked about now because all you hear today yeah. is Bush went in there you know uh, trying to, to, to finish the job <laughs> that his father didn't yeah. and there wasn't any mass weapons of mass destruction he completely fucked everything up um, I, I don't, I, this is the first time I'm, I'm hearing of this story I mean, to be honest with you, look, Bush may have won in there and people think, you know, Bush won in. But to be honest with you, if sit down, have a state in power. What are we facing today? Yeah. And I guess that that's the question, because there is two sides of that debate. If yeah. Saddam stays there, yeah. then that country stays the way it is. Americans <laughs> aren't in a 20 year war right now. Yeah. Uh, and the other side of it is, are the Iraqi people happy that? America has quote unquote liberated them and and or tried to and tried yeah. to make that country into a democracy. What is the right answer as an Iraqi? I guess I would have to say things change over years in Iraq. When the Americans first entered Iraq, people were happy. That's why I didn't have any violence for a period amount of time. Mm. But <laughs> we had one bad guy was Saddam, Al Qaeda, the Islamic State. All these groups were not they didn't exist in Iraq. Because Saddam was the the main power, and he never allowed any religious. And, and Saddam was not a religious guy. He was not a radical. He was a criminal. Yeah. But he yeah. was not He's a religious a gangster, radical. Yeah, the yeah. guy is is a bastard. He, yeah. he drinks and he yeah. he does whatever. Fucks the hell he, and, yeah. he, he he exactly. He sees he, pretty he had, women. He'll go after them. But he had a copy of the Quran written in blood. Which if yeah. you know anything about Islam, that's like yeah, that's like what no the no fuck man. Yeah, and and you know I think he went crazy towards <laughs> his end because people were prizing him so high. People were mm -hmm. telling him like, oh you're you're the best thing God ever created. He, he thought like he was. He was something. He, was, he thought he was Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And when Al-Qaeda entered Iraq, they, when the U.S. military entered Iraq, they left the borders open. Uh, that's when we started seeing the radicals in Iraq, which I've never seen. You, know, you got rid of the Ba'athists, which was Saddam political party, and all of a sudden you're looking at the radicals, the people with the long beards mm -hmm. and the nasty-looking thing and the dark spots in their forehead, and you're like, holy crap, Like this guy prays more than he drinks water during the day. And yeah. he's like... There was no way I can communicate with this guy yeah. and mm -hmm. with his ideology. So the things change, but the Iraqi people started based on their education, getting radicalized. A reason why the Ambar province <clears throat> got radicalized badly, because a lot of those religious figures who were fought by Saddam or Saddam didn't like were originally from that place. So guess what? When they went back, they controlled every mosque in the area. Every mosque was under their control. And they started preaching. And Ambar province became, I mean, 1,200 Marines died over there. Mm. I mean, it, it became the, the, the whole, the worst spots in the world. And, you know, Baghdad, you had Muqtada al-Sadr, which was the Shia militias that got established under yeah, him. Yeah, Almighty. That's who Jared and I fought while yeah. we were over there. Yeah, Sadr and, and you know, al-Sadr became mm. big with, because his dad was a big religious figure mm. in Iraq. He was priced so high, and Saddam Saddam's killed his dad. dad. Okay. No, 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 no. Muqtada al Sadr. Okay. Okay. So was, they were kind of like the resistance. So 83% yeah. 80, of Iraq is Shia, actually. But Saddam and Ba'ath Party, they're soon, well, they became over time Sunni. So they, yeah. from a minority position, controlled that whole country through fear and violence. So Muqtada al Sadr's dad yeah. was kind of a prophet, I guess, in a way, against that shit. And then Muqtada yeah. al Sadr was the leader of the Jaysh al Mahdi, the Mahdi army. And yeah. that, that was the resistance fighter. So, something against that shit. interesting about Muqtada al Sadr. Mm -hmm. Is that when Saddam killed his dad, killed his dad and his three brothers, assassinated them as they were going home from one of the mosques or mm. whatever they had. <clears throat> and Saddam left only Muqtada, Assad, which told you something. Why Saddam didn't kill Muqtada? Because he wasn't worried about him. Because he was like, oh, that's the stupid kid in the family. He's, he don't have to worry about Vito him. Vito Corleone. <laughs> and imagine based on his dad glory, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Muqtada was bright. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Muqtada Sadr was uh, mentally ill and behind. And his dad died, and Saddam is gone, and all of a sudden four million people are kissing your toes, telling you that, tell me to jump over the bridge, I'll jump. And Muqtada all of a sudden became, 
He didn't even know how to talk. The guy didn't even know how to, to give a speech at the beginning. He was messing around so bad. He was like coming on TV and saying, soccer is, is forbidden. Don't play soccer anymore. <laughs> and it's really messed up. Like he was doing some messed up stuff. But so you over, think he's like le- legit mentally retarded or something? He is. Oh, shit. Actually, he is. That. People don't believe that. If you speak Arabic and you listen to what the guy was talking yeah. in the beginning of his years when, yeah. when you know, he got all the freedom and all of a sudden he was big, he was saying the stupidest thing <laughs> you will ever hear in your life. I mean, God. And when al Madden militias engaged with the U.S. military, which you, you would know that, yeah, yeah. there was videos of him actually giving orders to the commanders. I mean, you would pee your <laughs> pants. If you actually translate those videos, how he's how he's talking about war tactics, uh-huh. oh no, they, you they were not you good. would just I, I mean you would just like drop in the ground, like uh, he was wearing a uniform and he was like way overweight, and you can see the button of that uniform about to pop out, <laughs> and he he would be like, look, if you go to one position, and you get stuck there, just stuck there, don't come back, just just stay there. And the way he talks to them, Jesus Christ! And they're listening to him, and then you, people, you know, some of them will jump in and be like, "I need support." He's like, "Stop! You've been asking me for support forever. I don't have crap. I'm stuck myself, you know." And you look into it; it's like funny. Yeah. And he'd be like, "This guy, unless actually, you're in it, you know." And he'd be like, shit. "This dude actually, it's like Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> Napoleon yeah. Dynamite, who had four million soldiers in front of him, and, he's, <laughs> and it was like he was giving them orders, and all of a sudden." You know that that it, they would come out and they were not mature fighters as, as Al Qaeda and, and uh, no, Daniel would agree on that. No, they were a bunch of fucking idiots. They were the worst yeah. fighters, like the worst. Yeah. Um. So do you remember that picture that I'm that I showed you of the the stencil of the guy like shushing and it has a warning against working with the Americans and Jews. Yes. He put those all over Baghdad, right? Yeah. I drew orange dicks on like 400 of those things. <laughs> hey, all over the damn. country because fuck that guy. Yeah. I he's, didn't know he was retarded though. That yeah, he's, he's, he still is and actually the nice part of it is Iraqis today, they're, as we talk today, Iraqis are protesting against the Iranian militias, against the Iraqi government who is he's now always been backed by Iran. Because like he's, he's now part of the government. This yeah. dude right now controls 60% of the Iraqi government. He almost, so he's, he's won, he almost won the oh, yeah. prime minister. He's, he's a billionaire now. I mean, you're talking about the guy has so much money. The retarded yeah. guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. He has so much money. Wow. Like He's Sergeant Bilko, yeah. but he's a terrorist and he's rich. Man. Yeah, he's rich. He, he, <laughs> they gave him like the Ministry of Oil, which <clears throat> that's like the biggest income in yeah. Iraq. And he, he, he controls everything. But the, the nice part is that her, here's, what, here's what invading Iraq gave you. It gave you a generation today in Iraq that grew up not hating America, had access to the internet, which they can see what's going on outside of the world. And today, for the first time, they're standing up to the bad people. They're not afraid of them. And they're t- standing up to Muqtada and saying, you're full of crap. We don't need to follow you. Don't bring your power over us. We're right. free people. And that's what gave you. It gave you that this is a nation that got liberated. It took time. But the kid that I fought for in 2005 and 2004 during the surge, who was not being, who was not being uh, terrorized, right. today is fighting mm. and standing up saying, F it, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to let you take over my rights or my freedom. I, I want to wear jeans and I want to sing rock and I want to do whatever I want to do. You don't tell, I don't care about your religion. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part that people don't see, that the new generation of Iraq is, is vicious. And they're standing up today. And actually, as of we're talking today, which the media don't report that, as we're talking right now, they're shooting them in the head with right bullets. And they're not backing up. Fuck. Um, let me ask you this. Were you there when Saddam got beheaded? I mean, when he got hanged. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Hanged, yeah. Hanged. Well, didn't his head pop off? Yeah, it did. It did. It did. So that's, that's, that, that is yeah, real, Yeah, because right? he had some cancer goes, goes going on, and that's why his neck didn't hold. Got it, yeah. got it, got it. So were you living there? Yeah, I was there. I was in the military. I was, like, watching everything happen. What, yeah. And what was that like uh, that, that night? Was there a party? Was there a celebration? What, what uh, goes on? Because, uh, obviously, you grew up under that regime. Yeah, there, there was definitely no party because, as a military guy, you're, you're expecting a reaction to that. So we were actually afraid of the next reaction. It was like, what, these, what is his loyalist going to do next mm-hmm. to revenge back? And... um. There was not enough justice to see what Saddam did. You know, to be honest with you, in my opinion, um, Saddam would take 25% responsibility for the crimes he committed. Okay. 75% of the people that worked under him. 
I mean, some of the names that you don't know about probably, like Kamakal Ali, his Chemical cousin. Kamakal Ali, yeah. He was, he was Kamakal Ali because he used chemicals in any missions that Saddam assigned mm. him on. Yeah. He buried almost 400,000 people alive and in the sand. This guy was vicious. Even as a civilian, though, we know that, that name. Yeah, 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 yeah. we know yeah. that Kamakal name. Ali. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> the people that worked under him were more vicious, and mostly they were members of his tribe, people in his family. From but the, the, the truth is, Saddam, if he didn't trust you, he would kill you, mm. even if you were his son. That's, that's, that's how Saddam is. Saddam's like a mafia leader that got raised up to become a president. And um, he, he I, I, and I will say, because yeah. I watched that footage, uh, part of it, because it yeah. cut out when the head popped yeah. off or whatever. Um, yeah. The, he seemed defiant till the end. Oh, I even at the trial, man. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 great do, question. Do you remember what his last words were? Yeah, because I, yes. I couldn't understand Great question. It. Do you know why he looked so confident dying? No. And that was a mistake on the Iraqi government. Um, uh, part. Most of these people who are uh, anti-Saddam, who, who left Iraq, the people who are in charge of making that court happen were people who came from Iran. Mm. They were Iraqis who escaped Iraq, and they were against Saddam, and they were in Iran. So he got motivated when he saw his enemies in front of him. I'm coming to kill you, and I see the enemies that you face all your life mm. in front of you. That motivated him, and that should not have happened. And there was some cons conspiracy theory saying that Muqtada al-Sadr, the stupid guy we're talking about, mm -hmm. was actually also there. So that gave him a motivation to feel like, yeah, I am not a criminal. I am actually, I fought my enemies to the end, and here they are trying to kill me. So that gave him the motivation. And these people should have never been inside of the court. They no. should have never been inside his execution. I don't think they should have even hanged him. They should have walked him out in the middle of the street in Baghdad and put a bullet in his head. Right he actually everybody. asked for that. Yeah, he actually requested said, you know, I'm a military guy mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Shoot me to the head with a bullet and they said no, we're gonna hang you It would have been more meaningful to the Iraqi population if they had shot him yeah. in, the head in the street I mean, I'll give that's you what they know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'll yeah, give yeah. you one interesting information. Do you know? <laughs> uh, President Talibani the Kurd mm -hmm. He he died about a, a couple years ago mm -hmm. Do you know he was the first president in our history to have a normal death? To not get assassinated. Yeah, did not really? get assassinated or get executed. Yeah, I didn't know that actually. In Iraq, <laughs> he was the first ever in the history of our country. Did you die of natural causes. Who died of natural causes? <laughs> and and we were so messed up that we started like questioning ourselves. Did he really die of natural causes? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, we're like, yeah. he, they're, like he they're like they're like guys. He's old. <laughs> but but it was really like interesting. We're like, oh my god! Like we just had the first president who died of natural causes because before that we either they got executed, either they got they got killed, mm. you know, and Saddam got hanged. And, and uh, yes, he, Saddam is a very interesting personality, and you can never su say Saddam is dumb. Anybody tells you that is wrong. No, he's right. a yeah, If you can get sure. anybody, you know, he, even Hitler, right, oh, yeah. to believe in all that bullshit yeah. for that oh, yeah. many years. Exactly. You know. I mean, look, at Saddam was, if you re read into the history of Saddam, how he came up, how he... How he controlled the government? The first thing he did when he took power was start spending money on schools and hospitals. Like he he was like a, it was an information operation campaign. He didn't yeah, like it's a long game. He didn't come in and start cracking heads immediately. Right. He did it on the sly. But the first yeah. thing he did was start building infrastructure around the country. Um, Super smart guy. Imagine ten minutes before he takes over as the president of Iraq, he executed all his friends. Anybody that knows anything about him or have did anything messed up with him. Because he worked as a gang gangster, yeah. a gang member in Baghdad back in the day. He was smuggling and shit mostly. Right? And there was a gang member who was above him who, like, he, he took him under his wing, who sure. took Saddam under his wing. Ten minutes before he became president, they brought him all in one room and shot him. And these were his best friends. These were people, <laughs> like, they never done anything to him. Why, why did he do that? So nobody would know anything. Nobody would oh, see. about his life? Uh, nobody mm. would know anything about his life. It came to the point, ah. like, he was so different the way he thought and he he sometimes will look at people without talking to them and he would know their intention like this guy was a psychology like maniac mm. and he would look at people and not talk to them and then be, that, they wouldn't they, they will immediately be guilty because he would know based on their body language if they are betraying him or if they're not like, this guy have passed above and beyond what a human psychology is, and people were terrified of him. He has no mercy for anybody. And uh, he controlled that country with a fist for 35 years. 
And they said that, you know, some of the previous people who worked for him mm -hmm. said that, you know, they'll be terrified of his look. You know, they said things that he would do or certain things that he would do and make that person uncomfortable. And um, he, he was a dictator, a bad person, a mafia leader. But once he got away, once we took him down, we had like a thousand Saddam Hussein. That's when yeah. all the criminals of mm -hmm. Iraq yeah, yeah, yeah. rised up. <laughs> Muqtada Sadr, the battle corps. Which that, that's all the, his, that's the know, argument against taking him down. Of yeah. Like, hey, yeah. man, if you yeah. would have left him in True. power, uh, then. You would have had one criminal. One guy. Yeah. Now you got a thousand guys. So mm -hmm. which, which was. Because if you look at it, was he worse. was the one criminal. Mm -hmm. And there was about a thousand criminals that were fighting him to take that power. Mm -hmm. We took him down. Now the thousand criminals splitted that in halves. So what happens in the Iraqi government right now, it's splitted among all these criminals. The Battle Corps, which is Iranian-backed up militia who was mm. against Saddam, takes mm. a certain amount of parts in the Iraqi government. Muqtada Sadr takes the Ministry of Oil and other ministries that make great money. The, the Sunnis get the Ministry of Defense. The Shia get the Ministry of Interior. And that's how we've been. Uh. And, and that's why, like, you know... Can they, you turn that country around? Because if there's so many different people fighting for power... How do you, how do you make it a civilization that only the people of Iraq can do that? Gotcha. And that's why, like, the people of Iraq <clears throat> right now is rising, and we should help them. But the problem is the media don't cover here about what happens on the other side of the world. And of course, our government wants a stable Iraqi government, and you know, mixed of everybody. But they don't realize that the Iraqis in the Iraqi government right now, who is leading, are not Iraqis who lived in Iraq most of their life. These people mm -hmm. lived in Iran. And they're loyal to Ayatollah, to the, to the Ayatollah, to the supreme leader of Iran. Their loyalty is not for Iraq. So whereas Iraqis are facing people who might have lived in our country, but their loyalty is outside of the country. Yeah, well, look, I, I can tell you, you know, from an American perspective, especially with the media here, a 20-year yeah. war isn't yeah. sexy enough anymore. Yeah. So, and it's not going to sell anything. You're not going to get viewers. Whereas talking about Trump every day. Here yeah. in America, yeah, that's what's going to get advertising dollars. So that's all they're going to report. Because unless somebody like you comes on the show, right? Mm -hmm. We I, don't know these stories. I would to be say, honest with you. I, I would say this: that you know, you know, always I, I give the American people two options. You're in the Middle East. You don't like it. Iran right now is our main competitor in the Middle East. Iran right now is the only country that we're facing that has arms outside of their own country mm -hmm. because the Iranian. <clears throat> Constitution state that they want to take the revolution and manufacture it and send it over to the rest of the country. Yep. They want to take the rest of the Middle East into Iran. Their yep. dream is to have the Persian Empire. Yep. So they have people in Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, mm -hmm. against Israel. They have in Syria. They have people in Iraq, which are the people that, that oppress us and control our government today and, and steal every penny that Iraq makes. And they have them in, in everywhere. And the only country that's really doing a great job, in my opinion, of dealing with that is Jordan right now. Yeah, because the, the Jordanian yeah. intelligence service is pretty. And they're good. not big either. You know, they don't have a, a no, they tiny, don't have a Shia country. Yeah. Uh, influence. Yeah, true, like these yeah. countries yep. do. So <clears throat> if you pull out of the Middle East and let Iran be the main player, how is that going to affect your interest as an American? You have to ask yourself, we do business with the Saudis. Yep. If we leave them today. What would happen? We just made eight hundred billion dollar deal with those Saudis. Well, how do we make this eight hundred billion dollars? We made that eight hundred billion dollars based on the fear of Iranians. Saudis fear Iranians attacking them, so we sold them weapons. We've been making great money out of this mess. Sure. So when people says, "Oh, let's pull out," well, then there's no money for us anymore. Right. And if we just let the Iranians took over, in a couple of years, Iran will call all shots. And we don't want that to happen. So this war is not just about being in the Middle East for no reason. We have an interest as a country. We're the greatest country in the world. And they want to be the greatest country in the world, too, because they want to get bigger. It's, it's going to be one boss. And you have to decide who, who do you want to be the boss. And in my opinion is that we might not have to go to war in the Middle East, but we still have to be the main player because the Iranians are always doing things against our interests. You know, we have a great money invested there. Based on that fear, we have made so much money. We sold so much weapons. We sold weapons to the Kuwaitis, to the Qataris. We sold weapons to the Saudis. I mean, the Saudis have a, a little war with Yemen, 
which is like a small militia in Yemen. Yeah. And look how much money they spend in our country. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. forced them to actually <laughs> cancel some contracts with the Russians and come contract with Boeings and some of our airplanes and buy some of our stuff. Mm-hmm. So this is, is for our interests. Like, this is not about politics. This is not about, oh, we, we're in Iraq because we're taking their oil. No, no, it's not the case. We don't need Iraq oil. But, you know, we need to be there as a main player. This is for our interest. And as, you know, as a Trump said, he's like, I don't have to run after uh, some guy in New York City for a $150 tax. Yeah. But I can get the Saudis to give me $500 billions right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's how politics is, right? Like, what do you... If you have a president, what do you want from him? If you're doing this for me, I'm like, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get that money because I don't want the Iranians. I don't want the Russians taking that money. Sure. This should be in my pocket. The, the interesting part about this is you say we because you are an American citizen. Yeah, I am. Today. Yes. When did you get out of Iraq and why? 2008. Okay. When my job ended as an intelligent asset, I had to leave the country. That's what I Because my identity ah, was. Maybe we were on the same flight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you were Delta? on my flight, man. Was it Delta? <laughs> actually, it was. Uh, Mine was Delta. So, <laughs> yes. I don't remember actually what it was. Yeah, I mean, it, I left because my identity was exposed, and and you know the whole country wanted to cut my head, so I had to leave. Does Does your family get to come with you? No, I left. I came here alone. Oh, so yeah. I, I, are I, they I, still I, there? And do they know? S- some of my family members are still there. Are they alive? Yeah, I don't have any contacts with them, but I. Left, I was left alone. I, was, I didn't have any communications with anybody. So I left, and they said, you have to leave the country. I left, and I came here, and I knew I couldn't go back to Iraq. It was over. That's it. I, I moved into a different life. And, uh, you know, I came out of that actions all of a sudden. I came from, like, being in front of al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and all that world, and I found myself, like, in Washington, D.C., in, in the Harris Theaters. Really? Yep. Yeah found myself in a grocery store and I was just like, I'm like, wow. Yeah. What's a hot bar? And I'm looking, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, you can actually buy apples and, and chickens at the same time, which is, was big for me. I never oh, had sure. that options. Yeah. I'm sure. Never seen something where it's like limited. You can just buy whatever. And I'm looking in there and I'm just sitting in the grocery store and I'm like, you know, if Iraqis knew how to fix their crap, and get together. We can, maybe we can eat chickens and apples at the same time. That's what I think the solution is. We drop <laughs> yeah. a couple of Walmarts over there. <laughs> it's, and over. Just, it's over the next <laughs> like, day. Because oh, people are like, people have like convenience and comfort, and then they don't care about radical shit anymore. No. It's over. Yeah. Like, See, you, you can do the Walmart branch over there. Yeah. If it's me, I'll do a Hooters. <laughs> oh boy, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with him on that one. I love their fucking wings. Yeah, that's dude. when I. They're, that's they're when I cease thing. fire in Iraq. <laughs> yep. Uh, that's when I want to do a ceasefire. <laughs> I'll do Hooters. I'll open a Hooters and I'll be like, the whole nation right now is in Hooters. I'll yeah. just broadcast straight to Hooters. Ten years, this guy's gonna have a chain of fucking Hooters. <laughs> I hope you do. All, of a all the shit you went through getting beat with a hose. I hope you have fucking ten Hooters. Dude. <laughs> <I> mean, like, <laughs> two Hooters. Yeah. What so, do you, so speaking of that, what do you do today? What do you do? So I I have worked in the last ten years. I've been working for the military, uh, designing, being part of the, it's called Insider Threat Exercise. Okay. So as you saw my film in my story, mm-hmm. um, it's the only experiment of what how to combat insider threat. Insider threat is when they recruit people in the inside where Americans are working. Like blue on green And stuff. they can put a bomb on them and blow them yeah. up. So my story in my film has become an educational tool for the U.S. military on how to actually recruit people, how to build relationships with people from foreign countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. Unfortunately, since 2007, 100, 173 Americans died from this style of attacks. A lot of them in Afghanistan at those bay like yeah. coast, for example. A lot of guys, a lot of people died there, including that female intelligence officer. A lot of stuff like that. So yeah, and Af- in Afghan Syria, the last one was in Syria. Yeah, it was that female intelligence officer yeah. and uh, special forces guy and a former SEAL. Uh, sh- was it Shannon? Yep, uh, what's Sh- Shannon. I forgot her last name. Fuck. Yeah, we, and we did. Coffee or Die did a piece on it. Yeah, her. I know yeah. Exactly they're actually trying to about, name yeah. a battleship after her right yeah. now. Right now, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We talked about it on the show. So I, I done this for the last ten years. Um, I have made a few companies rich doing that and then i just realized like you know i i i don't i didn't want to do this for a gain of money i was doing it out of my love out of my respect for the soldiers that i served with and i would never say no to anybody in uniform who calls me up to come and do training with them Mm -hmm. um you know i so perhaps i'm i left that job i'm not doing anymore i'm still getting calls i'm supposed to be here in wilmington too in november to do training with a unit as well so i've been doing that for so long and um 
And uh, now I just more just left that industry. I've been more focusing in my film. I directed my own film. I don't know if you guys noticed. So I ended up directing my own film. I did, and that was that, that, that was actually my next question. Is it, it's because look, I've I've done a bunch of movies. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, that is a, a wild jump from yeah being in the military to just hey, I'm going to direct my own movie. Yeah. Um, how and why? Uh, because I that's. that's to direct your own story good, about, good uh, question. about your life is something that I don't know that I would want to do because you're, yeah. you're going to have to essentially relive and watch your own life yeah. in front of you day after day, take after take. And it's like... And it's painful. Oh, yes. And, and so what do you... Like in the movie when you're getting beat and all that yeah. stuff, right? Interesting. What do you tell your child self how to yeah. direct them of like, hey man, that's not yeah. how I was screaming. Yeah, it's interesting because me and Daniel actually were talking about this today. Yeah. Um, coming in. Um, at the beginning, I wanted people to finish my film. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that there is not many Muslim American patriotic heroes in this community. There's like maybe one or two. And when you say in this community, what you mean in you're US. talking about like veteran community, yeah, yeah, the veteran community. You know, there, there's not many. You know, there, there's a couple uh, gold star families, people who died. Mm. Uh, you know, and um, when you have a background like mine, it's kind of dangerous because a lot of pol political agendas want to ride your story for their political gains, right? And unfortunately, you know, I had some individuals who who wanted to. Who are more Exploited. interested of my background? Who, who are more interested of my background than what I have done? And like how to use them as a political? How do you use them? How to exploit you? Yeah. How, how to really use you as as a political uh, weapon? And I, mm. I didn't. My story has nothing to do with politics, howsoever. People I was saving, I don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they look like. I don't know what their backgrounds or what their where where in America they're from or whether skin color or religion. I don't. I don't know. Most of the people I was saving, I never met them. I don't know who they are. So my story has nothing to do with politics. Uh, and at that time, I felt this would be dangerous. So I came to a point where I was like, I might just not do it because it's exposed to that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was home and I was like, the only way it would happen, mm -hmm. because you have people who are very sensitive in this film. This is a first military intelligence documentary to be released to the public. The footage in this film is not reenactment. It's mostly from our footage, mm -hmm. and it's from terrorist footage as well, which we confiscated on their cameras. Terrorists have their own media people <laughs> that film their activities. And most of the time, back in these terrorist cells, uh, we would confiscate the the memory mm -hmm. cards that they have in their cameras. And uh, one of actually the biggest hurdles for me, they were using SD cameras, so I had to enhance the footage mm -hmm. to clear it for HD. And... It, it came to the point I was like, you know, it's, it's either I do it myself, either I don't do it and, and just leave it out of it because I have, you know, the CIA director, Joel J David Petraeus, is involved in it. Some active agents are still in the field, uh, high-ranking uh, individuals in the U.S. military. So I was really debating, and then I actually took a break from work for about a year. I went, I went to film training. I went to like editing training, film training, and figure out how I can put all this, all these operations in, in an hour, few minutes movie. Yeah, because uh, the, for me, again, with a Hollywood background, like yeah. the financiers typically won't give a first time filmmaker money to do this. Yeah. Um, but they were cool with you doing all of it yourself? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I funded most of it myself. Okay. And I had a, another, you know, I had like, a funding source who who I knew and I trusted and I knew who exactly who it was. Sure. Um, and then I just uh, you know I I went on with it and I I figured that I just wanted that people to know because I realized at that point many Americans were dying from insider threat. There was no strategy in the ground how to combat this, um, and I realized that politically here in America there was a lot of agenda being used towards people like myself. So I wanted people to know that like. <clears throat> because I, being honest with you, which I've never said this before in any show, when I came out of that uniform, which was my superhero uniform, I call it my superhero suit. When I came to this country, I was just, I looked like just like any other brown guy. I had a hard time with some people 
who would judge you, who don't know you, uh, who would just think you're a bad guy as well. Wally, the guy that I told you about, the Afghan yeah. Special Forces Commando Commander that works at Black Rifle, mm -hmm. uh, t says the same thing. He was working at a fucking gas station in yeah. rural Virginia, and none of the families in the neighborhood would let their kids play with his kids. Because they were fucking yeah, Afghan. Damn Virginia. That's yeah. what I was too. And yeah, <laughs> like you're, you're a fucking terrorist, man. Yeah. yeah and it, they don't really, know that that dude's killed more terrorists than they've ever seen on the fucking news or in a movie. Sure. And, it, and you, you really can tell because you know what? Uh, people like Daniel, I will just have a conversation that will never stop with them. Because mm -hmm. if they were there, they understand mm -hmm. what the difference are. Yep. The problem is when you talk to people who are very close-minded, they don't know the difference, they've never been in the military, and they're just judging you based on the news. And they just look at you and they give you that. You feel it in, in your inside of you. You'll feel that. I, I and think it's, it's hard. actually pretty easy to tell the difference, though. There's one person who wants to, for yeah. example, come here and start a Hooters franchise versus yeah. Yeah. Ellen Omar, who wants to fucking yeah. bring Somalia True. to yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You know what it, I mean? True. Very, not that she's a terrorist or anything, yeah. but she is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Exactly. At least involved. Which in they that. are originally <clears throat> terrorists. It's, yeah. like, it's like the second line of terrorists. They're pretty terrorists. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 the sad part is, it was for me, it was like, how can I be just a normal person and not have anybody judge you or mm. judge you on your ba based on the way you look? And, you know, like some people, I worked certain jobs when I first got here, and some people were like, you know, they were like, you know, this guy looked like a terrorist. And you can hear it. And you'd be like, I'm not a terrorist, but I used to locate him. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. like what would you like me to tell you? Like, <laughs> I know who they are. They don't open deodorant, dude. Don't go near them. So, <laughs> but it, it was, it, it is just like, you know, it was, it was hard. So I understood the culture. I immediately understood, like, okay, there's a lot of educations need to be shown around. Mm. So I felt like mm. actually putting the film out there, and especially as Daniel watched the film, mm. that the film explains each terrorist organization and what agendas they were there for. Mm. Right. Some were there to kill Americans. Some were there for their own power, for their own gain. Some, it was a business for them. They were making millions of dollars. They were... Uh, making America sign a weapon deals because America was paying the bill at that time in Iraq for the <laughs> weapons for the Iraqi military. And they, they would say, oh, we're going to get you 100,000 M249s from the United States. And then when the weapons arrived, it's like a weapons from World War II. And someone <laughs> yeah. stole the money and ran to a European yeah. country. That happened in Iraq all the time. Th this is information I transfer to U.S. intelligence mm -hmm. all the time. And uh, people have no education. I realize here in America, especially like average citizens they don't understand what terrorism is and what the deep r routes of terrorism and that's why when Ilhan Umar came out to the public there was a lot of controversy there's a lot of uh, problems people are accusing one another one's saying one is racist one saying one is anti-American and mm -hmm. and I believe that this is the price you pay for people who wants to hijack your identity because we you know here in this country uh we have Muslims, Americans, almost 7 million Muslim Americans that lives here, <laughs> and um, certain political agendas want to keep them thinking one way, want to scare them from the rest of their fellow Americans, saying, oh, they, they hate you, they don't want you near here, they don't want you here. It's not true. You know, I have been around people in the left and, and right side of this country. I understood each person and what their concerns are. I, I have been to events where people had the Confederate flag. They were not any threats to me. Mm -hmm. I had a normal conversation with them. Um, some of them were not military, so I had to explain a lot more about what exactly the war was like. Sure. And um, I don't see anybody as danger in anything, honestly. I, I have I had conversations with people who are members of the KKK because I went to an area that was, like, different. Yeah. No one ever in my color Difference. been in that area. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, it, you know... <clears throat> I, I, I just, I, my message is to educate, you know, not to fight with them, not to do anything. They might say something that I don't agree with, but I educate. I'm like, when it comes to terrorism, this is what terrorism is. Does these terrorists want to control America? Yes, because they can't beat us in battle, but they can beat us politically. Right. And um, funding somebody who is part of the U.S. government to uh, be a problem for us or do they have a goal for 50 years from now where they want to be? Yeah, they want to mm -hmm. have control of this country. Because if I can't beat you physically, what can I do 
to control you. Well, they can at least make it taboo or, or off color to yeah. say certain things, like the travel ban, for example. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about this exhaustively, and I know you actually yeah. have spoken about it as well, but the idea that... So we didn't have diplomatic relationships with certain countries to be yeah. able to vet people Seven and know countries. who they were. Yeah. yeah that, th- that's why, look, I... Some of the countries, I think, probably should not have been on that list, but Syria, for example, is one that I've personally debated within USCIS yeah. and the intelligence part of it because I've worked there for a while. Yeah. And uh, there there were people from uh, from the Refugee and Asylum Office that are like, hey, we have a system to vet these people. I'm like, no, you don't. We don't have diplomatic relations yeah. with that country. How the fuck could you possibly vet them? And, and that's the truth. So making something, yeah. making having that that blunt conversation that is just a factual based conversation taboo to have is something that it's an information operations campaign. That's what it is. Like you stop people from having that conversation and then you fucking come in when you want. That's what the goal is over time, right? Yeah. It's those countries don't have a vetting process <clears throat> who they're no. sending us here. So we had to put a ban to protect yourself from knowing who they are because you're talking about like I mean the ID card is a piece of paper with yeah. Arabic written on it yeah it's going to be fake it. easily which I faked it when I was 17 so <laughs> yeah, 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 that yeah. tells you something yeah. well we've all had fake IDs let's be real here <laughs> you know so but I think I, I think it truly you know um, can I mention like name of political parties you can do whatever you want you can do okay, on this show so like there is a, a movement in America where the, automatically every Muslim that arrived in this country should have been an automatic Democrat. And that's not the case. And, and that's the movement. It's like, if you come in as an immigrant, you have to be automatically Democrat. Well, that's what the Democrats want as well. They, that's what they want. Yes. They want to get everybody, any minority. And yep. that's why it's I was talking same. about my story is yeah, that yeah. it was dangerous because I'm a minority and they want to use that minority line. And the truth is, is that um, this is not the case. You know, like... Um, not every Muslim in this country is a true Muslim. That's what I think. Right. Because I have known some of these people. Some of them jug more vodka than, than ever th- anything else. Sure, yeah. And I'm like, they're just named Muslim, but they're known practice. Right. I think there is a political Islamic movement in this country that I consider dangerous to our society, which what CARE stands for, what yeah. the Muslim Brotherhood, so, because they're putting millions of dollars for a reason. They're putting millions of dollars funding people, funding candidate, funding things or changing roles. It's dangerous. I think it's against our interests as Americans. So I, when I look at myself as an American, if I am a Muslim American, where my interest is? And my interest is for America, nothing else. My interest is not for Qatar. My interest is not in Saudi Arabia. My interest is not in, um, in any other countries or in Egypt or any other countries. I should look for my interest as an American. Mm-hmm. Not as anything else. Not as where I come from. Today, if I want to look at my interests, I want to look at my interests as an American, not as an Iraqi anymore, because I'm not an Iraq. M- my child is born and raised here. I'm looking for her interests as well. So our loyalty is to the country, should be to the country that has given us the rights that we didn't have in our own country. Yeah, see, this is what I believe too. But there is such a backlash when you say things like that, where you're like, hey, man, we're all Americans yeah. first. Yeah. I-, I think in today's current yeah. climate 2019 everybody's so quick to identify themselves with something else right yeah i'm an american plus this or plus something else and it's like no you, you should all be americans first because we live here we're raising our families yeah, here yeah. and we're the part that's truly baffling to me is you come from a country where you don't have any of this stuff that we have but you try to bring that bad part of your country here and mimic it for some reason like yeah. that that is the most puzzling part to me it'd be like if you started a fucking really brutal gang in your fucking neighborhood in North Carolina. Like, exactly. To, to like crack the heads of people who didn't believe in you, including subjugating yourself to that rule. Yeah. Like that wouldn't make any fucking sense, right? Yeah. But you have to know that there are people in here that influencing <clears throat> that. You know, there is political parties here that influence this ideology. Mm-hmm. Trying, oh, we, we trying know. To, yeah, 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 trying to make you feel like less afraid. Like I had people tell me like, you live in North Carolina? You know, aren't you afraid? I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, no, man. No, why, man. Have you been in why, why, <laughs> why should I be afraid? Have you? Well, I, that's what I would ask. Yeah. Have you been? No. Nice well, here. I live there. Yeah. And they're like, aren't you afraid? They're just going to kill you, man. They're like, they hang people. They're of color. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I live in Raleigh. Yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, I've been to all these areas that you're talking about, and no one has done anything like to me. And I'm <laughs> like, I have done book signings in places that no one ever been. Yeah. And I'm like, I have been there, and 
you know, it was a huge victory for me when someone was a, a white supremacist and bought a book from me. Sure. And I'm like, dude, he's going to read my book. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to change yeah. his mind. <laughs> you know, like he's going to. And I got one of these guys to say, hey, I appreciate what you've done, even though I don't agree, but I appreciate what you've done for this guy. I'm like, well, the solution to ignorance is never yeah. hate. It's information. It's, yeah. it's information. Yeah. So it's like, I was like, I'm winning in, in what I'm doing. So yeah. I was like, there's no <clears throat> that, but it's fear. You know, they put this immigrant, when he comes here, they put him in fear. They're like, if you're, if you're here, but if you get out an hour away, they're going to kill you. They're going to hurt you. Yeah. You need to be careful. You need to protect yourself. And this is all false information. We do have some people who are crazy. They'll give you nasty looks. Yeah. They, they, they'll, but, but you but have that everywhere. They right? have that everywhere, yeah. even in Iraq. But, you know, do, <laughs> do I feel most of the ignorant people that I face were stupid? Yeah. That's what I'm, mm. what I'm afraid of today is stupid. Stupidity. I, I'm yeah. not afraid of someone who's like, who says, oh, I'm, I love my country and I, I care for it and I just want to protect my guy. I'm not afraid of that guy. Why should I be afraid of him? Yeah, well, I love America too and I want to protect it too and I'm with you in the same line. But... The ones that get led behind these activities where, you know, organizations are paying millions of dollars in activities and raising Americans, young Americans to hate America. I don't like that. I'm against that. Um, you know, like you, when you see individuals like Rashida Talib, the, the Congress member Rashida Talib and mm -hmm. every th this she's idea. She's out of Michigan, right? Yes. Yeah, she's yeah. out of Michigan. Yeah. And it's majority. It's like. It's like you live in a state where all your cousins are. Of course, you're going to win. Dearborn, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, it's that all area. majority in there. But, and that's, that's, that's an example of it, is that this is not the way we should raise our kids about the country they were born in. We should not raise them like how to hate America and how to hate the Jews and all this ideology that she brought in from her own country, from Palestine. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, this is an international conflict. We have nothing to do with it here. We try to actually make peace in this conflict so many times. But raising children to hate their own country or their fellow country citizens, yeah. mm -hmm. that's messed up. Imagine the psychological ideology. effect that has on a child. It is. It does. That's like, that's like uh, the Catholic guilt thing. Like it being does. raised to feel guilty about everything you do. It yeah. fucking breeds this like self-hating bullshit. It, it's, it's a sickness over time, right? Yeah. I got a message about <laughs> a couple, a few days ago, actually. Um, it was from a, a young Iraqi who was born here in Michigan, um, who was actually in the military, mm -hmm. was deployed to Afghanistan, deployed to Iraq. And he sent me a message. He said, you know, I joined the military because of you. I read your story. And I realized that like, I'm, as, a, as a Muslim American, that I could, be, I could be helping. I could be doing something. And it amazed me because this kid was not born in Iraq. He was born here in Michigan and, and it made me feel great, you know, because I'm starting with one guy against all this influence. Sure. And it, it amazed me that, you know, like this is the reason why I released my story. This is the reason why I put myself in danger by putting a story like that out there, exposing myself and who I am. But it puts me back in the fight. Right. It, it puts me back to see that I am actually influencing people to do good things for this country not to do bad things to this country. And it, it amazed me to see that, to see like, you know, I, I am motivating young Muslims to go join the military and be a useful tool because they would be an amazing tool. Some of them speak foreign language. Some mm. of them we could use, they understand the culture. <clears throat> um, and uh, it, 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 it gives me pride that, you know, it's worth releasing my story. It's worth telling my story. And that actually motivated me more to, to release the film. To mm -hmm. let it go, uh, to, to influence, because I don't think your kids are being influenced, but there's a lot of kids who are young kids who are born here are being confused because someone want to use them for political gain. And when they go and do something stupid and something bad in this country, um, those, those people responsible don't take responsibility. They, they don't get pointed out. Mm. And, you know, I think that... Mm. Um, it really makes me angry to see, like, you know, Ilhan Omar is trying to release people who want to go to join ISIS and yeah. uh, trying to talk like to the judge. Like, they want to get that woman back into the country? Yeah. Like, right. get fucked. Yeah, yeah. You're done. Yeah, it, it, it's just like, <clears throat> I'm like, because this is what Americans look at us as. This is what yeah. Americans are going to look at me, even though I don't think this way. Yeah. Even yeah. though I'm going to do it that barbecues you all day. You're going to get lumped in. With, I'm going to get lumped in with this though. because yeah. they're going to think that's what I want. And not, it's, not, it's not true is that, you yeah. know, that... This is an influence. This mm -hmm. is this is a terrorist influence. 
Um, and as some says, you know, this is like a, a representative of terrorists with lipsticks on. That's yeah. how it is. Yeah. And uh, what's well, the same thing with gun ownership? Like yeah. what he's saying? No, yeah. nobody hates a shitty gun owner more than a responsible gun owner. Yeah. I, I, I imagine that nobody hates terrorists more than fucking Muslims who yeah. have to hear whispers like, oh, he's probably a terrorist. Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's, it really is. You know it's like I mean? our anger <clears throat> towards terrorists are like just as twice as yours. Yeah, I can't Because imagine. we lived, we, we were oppressed by them or we'd yeah. be mistreated or we lost family like members. Like for us, but, it's a couple of events yeah. throughout time. For them, it's every fucking day forever. Yeah, so like I think my message will be like to Muslims in America. I'm like, hey, don't be afraid to be part of the, your own country. Don't be afraid. Whatever they're telling you, they're lying to you. The world is not really all bad. Right. You know, like, you don't have to live this way. You can be part of this country. You can be part of this government. And, and don't be afraid of people who just want to protect their own country. That's not, that's not, they want to protect their own country. That's, that's how it is. And I would do the same. I want to protect this land because my daughter is safe here and has every right that I didn't have as a child. So I want to protect those rights for her. Mm-hmm. I don't want anybody to come and put her through what I went through. And that's not racism. Mm. You know, you can't call me racist for that. I mean, which is interesting because I, if Daniel would go say that, they'd be like, you're a racist. Oh, yeah. right, right, but right, if right, I come sure. on, they will say, you're messed up. You know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and it's, that's the, the norm that has been. They're like, don't you feel ashamed that you're helping the infidels? And, and I'm like, I'm like, screw you, dude. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like, no, you I'm don't even Hooters, know how to barbecue. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the really, it's a messed up mentality. But I'm happy to see that, you know, my story and my film is, is impacting young Muslims uh, to be part of what we do because we need them. We yeah. need them in this fight. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I look at some of these people who complain about America or they just say, oh, America's a terrible place and this and that and I'm like look man where, where did you come from yeah, mm-hmm. go to Baghdad yeah if you don't like it go 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 get, go back get, get out of here like you know, if like, Omar wants just to change go back America, so you know much, it, back it's not it's not a racist thing if you don't <laughs> like that we give you the freedom to do speech to do whatever you want to say what you want you don't like our military you think they're criminals go back yeah let me know what those criminals over there do to you yeah would they let you speak like the way you speak to us no. <laughs> you know, if, if she goes to Somalia right now, Ilhan, and tells the Somalis. Oh, she would be executed because you know, her like, f- family was part not of the to, fucking. Not to be pirates anymore. Right. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's one actually funny thing <laughs> that, you know, when I saw Ilhan Umar talking about the Mo- Mogadishu <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. thing, and I, I was laughing actually. You know, like I was laughing because I'm like, I'm like, you come from Somalia, where like the biggest country in the world that kidnap people and keep them on 320 <clears throat> days. On, on the sand in a harsh condition and they yeah. don't return them to their families. And here you're talking to us, telling us about that the soldiers who went to Mogadishu were criminals, even though they were fighting Mohammed Hadid, who was a terrorist. Yeah, for I'm Hadid, like, yeah. you're the last person. If I was you right now, I wouldn't be opening my mouth because, you know, <laughs> they made a whole Netflix series about how terrible some of those people are yeah. in Somalia. Oh, yeah. That's terrible, man. We're so lucky we, we don't have a whole series about Iraq <laughs> in there. We're not that terrible yet. Yes, yes. But, yeah. you know, I'm like, there's a whole series about kidnapping, about all these cases. And I'm like, why don't you go to these tribes and tell them to stop doing that to people? Look at what they do to people. I'm like, you come here and you tell us that we're bad people, that Americans are bad because they decided to speak their voice. I'm like, I don't, you know, it's it makes no sense. And... um She's winning out of communities that, where she has majority of S- Somali immigrants sure. mm-hmm. live there. And whatever they tell you, everything else is a lie. It's, that's how she won. That's how she got there. And um, whatever she's promoting, uh, you know, people should know that this is not a community. She does not represent nobody. She does not represent her and Rashida Talib does not represent the Muslim community, does not represent Muslims, does not represent you, young Muslims. She represents an agenda and a party. And that's what she represents. She yeah. represents a party, a political party, somebody who's paying millions and millions and millions of dollars for her to come and do what she does. Um, my Muslim friends who sell falafel all day and work so hard don't have time to look at Ilhan Omar. They don't care <laughs> what the hell she says or, or does, you know. And and perhaps they will never call a congressman. They'll be like the Somali ladies. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah, talking yeah. about the smile lady? I don't care. <laughs> what she said. And it really is just like, they don't care. 
I, I talk to so many young Muslims who reach out to me and says, oh, I want to join the U.S. <clears throat> military. I want, to be, I want to be a ranger. I want to be in the special forces because I speak Arabic. I speak Persian. I speak whatever. Mm. And, and, you know, and I, it makes me happy because I know, like, you know, people can see what's going on. Mm. And um, that's what I ask, like, sometimes conservative. I'm like, don't be so extreme. You know, try to distinguish who's your enemy, who's not. Uh, you know, you are, you, Muslims, Americans, there's seven million of them in this country. If every one of them is a terrorist, yeah, we'd be fucked. None of yeah. you will be alive. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's the truth. There'll just be bombs going but on all the time. But there is a political Islamic movement in this country that is actually after our freedom. After our, we all have to face that. Not just you, me too. Mm -hmm. They took most of my life. Yeah. You're trying to protect your guns. I'm trying to protect my life. Yeah. Like they. They're trying to take my life. If they take control of this country, they'll put Sharia law, and then uh, my daughter will be slaughtered in public. So I, uh, I'm against uh, you know any any of these agendas to be here. I'm against all that crap uh, having a Sharia law. Or, I'm like, no, dude, you can't beat your wife. That's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can't make that legal for you. No, sorry. You can do it over there. <laughs> she can't do it here. Not gonna fly here. Yeah, it, not gonna fly well, here. Well, in London, there's entire yeah. segments of the city yeah. now where please just don't go. Oh, UK. Oh, yeah. UK is doomed. Yeah, and it's like, and now Europe it's, is it's too. essentially de facto Sharia law because the the UK police won't go in there. Yeah. So they're just doing whatever the fuck. They oh, want Europe anyway. is doomed. Europe <clears> and the UK specifically. Because when if you let yourself to be too soft with these individuals, they will grow like cancer. Yep. And we're talking about Wahhabis. These are like Islamic radicals that <clears throat> they are radicals, man. Do they not know what's going on in London? No, or? they just allow them. They gave them too much freedom. Mm. They gave them too much of freedom, and they they just whatever. They just gave them too much freedom. You cannot give those too much freedom. And I mean, I'm I'm the first person to advise our intelligence agency. I'm like, if you feel somebody's about to do something, go get them. Don't wait for it. Yeah. But the problem is they're trying to make it in a way where you can't get them until the end. They have enough lawyers. They accuse you of raise. They know the, they know the counterattack. Right. They know how to do it. They know how this works. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that um, all these lobbyists, I call them lobbyists. I don't call them like, you know, terrorists. And everything. All these lobbyists that these countries and the Muslim Brotherhood and the Qataris and all these radicals, who are here trying to influence our politics should be out. You know, I, I tell Muslim Americans, if you're voting, vote for your interest. Don't vote for the country you come from. Mm. You're, you don't live there anymore. Yeah. You live here, vote for what serves your interest. And that's what I tell people. You know, people like, I, I know a lot of Muslims that went and voted for Trump. A lot of them went and voted for Trump. Wow. They just don't say in their communities they voted for Trump. Yeah, yeah. They really came out and they're like, yeah, I voted Hillary. They didn't. They voted for Trump. Because they feel inside of them that this is going to serve my best interest. Sure. And I feel um, conservatives should tap into these people. They should work with them. And I, I think to a certain degree they are. Um, but yeah. it's like you said where it's very hush-hush behind the scenes. Like, it you is. Know, and and yeah. people will, will come up to us on the street yeah, all the time yeah. and they'll be like, hey, man. <clears throat> I voted for Trump. You know, it's just like, it's, you don't have to whisper it. No. Yeah. It's also yeah, hard. It's okay. fine. You know, it's he's okay. president for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's 60 million people it's, who voted it's, for him. It's hard to break through that programming, too. Like, the black community in the United States has historically been Democratic for the same reason. And yeah. I've worked with Democratic candidates that are black yep. in politics. I've worked in politics with those guys. And there's a saying that uh, politicians only show up to the poor black neighborhoods right before it's time to vote. Yeah. And that's, that's the only yeah, time they ever show up. It's, it's, so it's like, and, and, but there are old black ladies. You could run anybody for any office. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to vote Democrat. Because yeah. it's so programmed into them at this point. Yeah, that they, yeah. So it's, it, it can be hard to break through that. The, the key is the younger people, though. You know, raising, like. Yeah. If, if you, it's if, interesting. If yeah. you were to go into one of these book signings with these racist-ass white people and yeah. just be like, man, fuck you guys. Nothing would be accomplished. They would hate yeah, you. Absolutely, you would hate yeah, absolutely. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. But if you're just like, whatever, I don't give a shit about this. Yeah, here's a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, honestly, that is how you fucking win. It, that's how you win, and that's how I look at it. I'm like, <clears> education <throat> is the tool, and you know, it's interesting. Remember when the refugee crisis was going on, mm -hmm. and you know, all these people who are screaming like, bring refugees, let the refugees in, or the ban, and things went nuts. Yeah, and you know, for me, I, I'm just a, a messed up person when it comes to things like that. I always think differently. And for me, like when I saw people with these signs, like, you know, refugees are welcome, I, I, they don't know who I am. Yeah. I'm like, I just want to go and say, hey, I, I want to stay in your house. 
I'm yeah. a refugee. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Can I can I share your fridge with you? Oh fucking funny. And they wouldn't be. let anybody. And I know some of them because I know I can see their backgrounds. I can know who these people personally. I know mm. them. Yeah. And I know that is it's it's nothing but a sign. Welcome refugees. Okay. Would you allow me in your house? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, not a prayer. Where should I go? To the shelter. Yeah. Same with the homelessness right now. And I'm like, so on. you would put me with the homeless and that's <laughs> what you're fighting for? I'm like, don't even worry about fighting for me. I don't I don't need that. Yeah. But, the, the, you know, I, I'd rather stay at a refugee camp than come in here at the homeless shelter because the homeless shelter here is, is worse. Yeah. But I'm looking at them like some of, some, some of these, uh, you know, individuals and, you know, churches and everybody that stood for that. I'm like, if you stand for kindness, help people. And, and, and if you don't, zip it. Sure. We don't want to hear it. Like you don't say, "I want to help refugees," and you're not helping nobody. No. And uh, and you're you're just really uh, supporting a political candidate, and you're supporting a statement, but you're not really making that support. So it's it's funny, you know. When I saw like um, Nancy Pelosi, and it was like I went and googled her house, and I was like, oh, she "What would in happen a very if nice I go?" Nice neighborhood in San Francisco, he, very nice. And she has one in Massachusetts too. And I was like, "What happens if I would go to her house right now, <laughs> and just rip off a couple of my shirts?" And just say, look, I'm a refugee and I have Can no I do place laundry here? to stay. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't even have laundry in the Middle East. College and shit. <laughs> Dude, we don't even have laundry machines. I mean, I'm lucky now I have two nice ones at home. But back in Iraq, you did it with your own oh, hands. Yeah. But I was like, what if I go to her house right now and say, look, I, I, I look like a refugee. Yeah. You know, I just don't. I just have to remove the gel out of my hair and just go and say, <laughs> look, I, I need a place to stay. Would she allow me in that house? Not one prayer. No. No. With the guard at that checkpoint that she has in front of her oh, house, yeah. Yeah. with a gun, what would he do to me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He'll probably arrest me and put me, <laughs> take me to jail. Yeah. And I'm like, this is all crap. And that's why I tell like Middle Easterns like me, I'm like, dude, they don't care about you. No. They care move about on, the vote. Ma- move on with your life. Go do what you got to <laughs> do. Go get a nice job. Make good money. Mm. No one's God, but none of these individuals truly care for your life. Right. Right. They don't care. You know, I, 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 I lived in Connecticut for four years when I came here and I had some issues that I ran into and I, I went and I asked a Democrat because we had a majority of Democrats. I asked like a politician to help mm. in my case. Can you help? And they turned their bag on me faster than you think. They oh, didn't I'm care. Sure. Yeah. They didn't know who I was. Yeah. So I just went in as like, whatever, yeah. Muhammad, whatever. Yeah. And I just went in like, I need help. And, and they, they wouldn't help you. You know, they don't care. They wouldn't help me. And I look at them when they come to talk about people like me. They talk, to, they talk like I was their baby. They care for my rights and everything. And I'm like, they don't care about you. Live your life to the fullest. Yep. Enjoy the freedom. And don't worry about what political, who supports you and who that. No one supports you. You're free. You're an American. You can go vote for whoever you want. And, and that's, that's how it is. You know, I, I, I supported Donald Trump, you know. Two days ago when, you know, Donald Trump pulled the troops from Syria and uh, I didn't support that decision. I'm like, I like the Kurds. Mm. The Kurds are, I, they're attached to me emotionally. I fought with them. I know what this does mean to them. I hope we protect them. Even if we pull out, I don't want to see the Kurds die. The good people, they're fighting for their identity. They're just like us. They want to be free. Um, you know, like I support to, with common sense, not to the, not blindly, not just because I love someone so bad. I, I don't have a, that loyalty. I'm the same. To, to a yeah, politician. Yeah. My loyalty is to the nation. Yeah. And that's like when I was fighting in Iraq or whatever I'd done in Iraq, it was to the American people. And there, there's a reason why I did what I did in Iraq. Many people ask me in every show, why would you do what happened? What would you do in Iraq? If it wasn't for the Americans who tra- treated me well in Iraq, if it wasn't for that mentality, that when I came to Iraq, these people cared about my life than my own people. If it wasn't for that culture that the American value stood for, I wouldn't have done what I have done in Iraq. I'll probably have said, screw them Mm -hmm. and walked away. But the people I faced for the first time in my life, the Americans I worked with cared about my life and made me feel I'm a human being in a country where I was never being treated as a human being. And that meant something to me. And that's why when people, you know, outside of the country get mad about when we pulled away from the Kurds, they think they, they think us as a nation. I told them of that overseas, and I said, don't judge this nation based on its politics. Right. Republican and Democrats, they've been making mistakes all their life. Oh, and it's not going to stop anytime you soon. You know, Obama no. pulled the troops, made a mistake. Now Trump <clears throat> pulled, you know, the, the 
the, 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 the you know the, the SF units. They're not even mm. big units yeah. away from the Kurds, and the Kurds have been dying. That's also a mistake. I was like, but at the end, this is not what Americans would do. Like I know the value and the culture of an American person, and if an American is fighting with you, he will not pull out of that fight. Sure. I'm like, I know. This is a governmental order. They're military, they have to follow orders. And there is an example, which you can actually host that person one day in your show. There is an example of Jim Gant, who was a former special forces officer in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. who were ordered to leave and pull out, and he refused. Because it was a code of honor, he fought with these guys, and he's like, I'm not gonna follow government orders, screw you, I am fighting. And he faced court martial and lost his job as an officer in the military. Um, but, you know, went to court, lost his pay, got demoted a rank. But in my opinion, Jim Gant is an American hero. He's a legend. Jim Gant stood to what an American is like. It's an honorable fighter who would not secure you all the way down to the end, and he will fight with you and give you that trust. And, and it, you know, I, I looked at it. I was like, you know, even Joe Betrayas helped him in that case as well, explained to the American uh, you know, and, and to the Pentagon that this is this is about honor. This is about culture. It's not about refusing orders. So th that's that's what I see. That's how I view the American people is that the American, the politics in America does not represent the average American. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this has uh, been one of the most fascinating interviews uh, we've ever had in almost 500 episodes. Uh, this is the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week. This is somebody that has inspired you or helped you to become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? You mean someone in my life? Mm -hmm. Yes. Someone inspired me and gave me. I um, in uh, my life, it would be Colonel John Burke, who was in my film. Okay. And um, the only reason I would choose Colonel Burke, I mean. Everybody, I, every intelligent officer, every person that I worked with has been more than amazing. Uh, the only reason I would give it to Colonel Burke because um, Colonel Burke cared my, about my life more than the information itself. And um, he fought with me in 2005 in Iraq. And in 2008, um, he put his foot in the ground to bring me home, to bring me here alive. <clears throat> and didn't care about any outcomes and cared about my life and for that, I would say he, he inspired me more because he showed me what the American values are standing for. Okay. Man, uh, where can everybody find your movie and your book? Um, so, this is, again, it was one of the best interviews of all time, man. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. My pleasure. If you want to find the film, the film is on Amazon, The Terrorist Whisper. Mm -hmm. It's the same name as my book. Um, it's the first military intelligence documentary to be released to the public. You can find it on Amazon. You can rent it or buy it. Uh, if you want to get a book, just go to my website, www.theterroristwhisper.com and you can get a book autographed uh, from my website which I autograph it personally for every well, person I'm going to need you to autograph this one exactly mind. Um, yeah yeah uh, amazing uh, go to Amazon um, check out his film uh, check out the book uh, Hamadi thank you for being here my pleasure thank and you I hope very I'm much I'm pronouncing that right no, absolutely Hamidi. you got it right hey, yeah. look at that you just got to say ham emphasis Hamidi. on the ham even though he's Hamidi. Muslim Hamadi yep. yeah go real hey welcome to North movie. Carolina Hamadi <laughs> <laughs> uh, no again this uh, it was amazing thank you again for being here it's my pleasure and honor being here thank yeah, you very man. much for having me for D'Anthony D'Anthony Holloway uh, Hamadi and uh, Ross Patterson uh, we're the drinking bros good night everyone